Hi everyone and welcome back for a new episode. So this is already the fifth edition. Uh, thanks for joining us again. So we have a pretty good agenda today. Uh, as you may have guessed from uh, the trailer we just saw, uh, we're going to be discussing about uh, mobile tracking and we have some pretty good guests uh, to discuss about it. Um, so first we're going to have uh, Gabriel who is going to talk about his uh, research on the uh, Xiaomi uh, phones. Uh, that's uh, pretty interesting. So he, he found out that uh, I know, a lot of the uh, data was actually being uh, exfiltrated, uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, then we're going to have Kostin, who is going to be uh, discussing uh, about uh, tracking mobile tracker. It's kind of a follow-up of his previous uh, presentation. And actually, um, today's uh, theme is uh, is ID. So uh, thanks again, uh, Kostin, for suggesting uh, the, the theme. and. Uh, or something if you guys have uh, any speakers you would like to see or if you've read a good blog post like uh, do not uh, hesitate to talk about it and uh, after we're gonna have uh, a panel uh, so with Gabriel, uh, Kostin and uh, Elliot obviously that's not uh, his real name as you have seen it's uh, the uh, Mr. Robot alias uh, but he's, French, uh, he's a French uh, security researcher and uh, last but not least we're gonna have uh, Tim Baker from uh, theory who's going to be talking about uh, his uh, last blog post where he was explaining uh, how he's exca escaping the uh, chrome sandbox uh, which is actually like pretty cool too uh, and uh, yeah so same thing uh, if you're not on the discord already uh, you're more than welcome to to join it we're around uh, 300 people now i think so since uh, the irc channel um uh, fell through you know like uh, discord has been a pretty uh, reliable uh, alternative uh, since then and uh, much easier to uh, to join um, and uh, yeah so just to re-explain some of the things from last time uh, if you want to uh, donate through msf you can still go on our website and uh, they have there is a donate button that goes straight to msf uh, whenever you click on it so you can uh, uh, make a donation there and the agenda obviously is on the website and yeah if you have been here like a few times already like uh, i'm pretty sure you're very familiar with the the format uh if you want to tweet anything uh about the the show don't forget to use the hashtag uh upcut 2020 uh, and uh yeah so if you have any questions uh, you can post them live and usually at the end of the presentation I will take your questions and ask the speaker the questions and if you have recommendations or suggestions for uh, future editions uh, yeah don't, don't hesitate to uh, to give any uh, any of them so that's uh, that's pretty much it uh, for now as uh, the introduction is pretty much the same as uh, usual uh, so I'm really looking forward uh, to this uh, session because as you may have seen, like uh, because we're in uh, May now, almost in June, there is more and more uh, applications being launched by a bunch of governments uh, to track people with COVID-19. So that's definitely something to look at. But before we talk about uh, this, you know, like uh, Gabriel's presentation, uh, is pretty good because it's basically telling you like even though everyone is panicking and talking about those like COVID-19 uh, apps that we need to install uh, well we should not wait for that to uh, start to wonder if our phone is acting uh, weirdly or not as it should be um, yeah so if you can hear me uh, yeah Gab you can st start sharing your screen and uh, yeah then uh, we'll sh launch the uh, the transition so but yeah if you have any questions anything uh guys don't hesitate and let me move this here up okay
Uh, hello, fellow humans. Sorry, uh, Zoom is acting up a bit. Let me share my screen again. Uh, ah, okay. All right, nice. Uh, sorry for the minor disruptions. Um, yeah, so today we're gonna talk about uh, cheap Android phones and my experience in acquiring them and how they acquired me in the end. So I'm going to do a small introduction then for those guys who are not that familiar with me. I just started working in this industry uh, not that much time away. Um, I'm pretty fresh in the industry. Uh, I started by hacking the public transit system in Romania at some point. And then when I discovered that the, my free fares are up, I turned my eyes on my car and found out that, that it knew way more about me than I knew about myself. Uh, long story short, it logged everything I was doing, how I was driving, contacts, whatever. Uh, just like the actor that we're gonna talk about today. Now, recently I started turning hunting bots for white ops, but I still keep my eye on any privacy infringing companies. Yeah, so I decided to get a Xiaomi phone. And I mean, why get a Chinese phone, right? I mean, everybody knows that they're tracking everything, yada, yada, yada. But hey, they're pretty big. I mean, it's a privately owned company. Uh, they are the fourth biggest phone seller in the world right now. Uh, I think, yeah, they just beat Samsung on India. And speaking of India, they are the first uh, right now when it comes to sales. Um, they make smartphones, tablets, batteries, laptops, TV, selfie sticks, I, uh, laser projectors, umbrellas. You can basically live your entire life in Xiaomi products. Uh, and as they are growing more and more, this is the graph of the market share that they have in India right now. As you can see, they're the biggest seller on the market. They have very cheap phones, very powerful phones, and I decided to go for them. And I ended up getting a Redmi Note 8. I think it's got a Snapdragon 660, uh, four gigs of RAM, a pretty large battery, um, a decent camera even, uh, NFC, a solid display, right? Uh, I mean, what's the catch? There should, something was up. My spidey sense was tingling, especially because it cost like 150 pounds. So for those that don't know about it, after Android 7, including, you can no longer intercept your SSL traffic. Uh, on your own phone if you're using your own certificate. So this screws up a lot of um, proxies and whatnot. So I got my brand new phone rooted, uh, installed the custom uh, system certificate so I could inspect the traffic that was going around. Uh, and yeah, in only three, three hours it sent more than 24 requests to some uh, random server in China. Uh, not China, but the domain was controlled, uh, was registered in China. Uh, it's a spy, a spy were in a box. They were sucking up all the data. Uh, my uh, uh, pie hole was seeing alarms going all over the place. Um, and inside their privacy, like, their EULA, you would, I would have consented to all of that data being shared. And this kind of became the new norm. And to give you an example of, what, of what's being shared right now, uh, I'm gonna present a small demo that I, um, that I did. Sorry for the potato quality, YouTube is uh, acting up. Anyway, when you're going incognito, at least the, you can't take screenshots or anything like that. So they kind of figured that out. 
but you can see that it's already doing a request right as I was browsing something. The page was loading up. And we have a request going right now. And this was the page that was going around in the background. Now we can get that data. Made the chef recipe already. It's already registering the DuckDuckGo query and logging it. It's logging page starts uh, when the page load starts, when the page load ended, and the URL that I navigated to. And it keeps going on. It's still got more stuff being sent. And this is the exact same web page that I uh, navigated just a few uh, seconds ago. Now, it, if they were logging this anonymously, let's say that this was something all right, but they didn't. They're logging uh, using a new ID to log, uh, to track, track you, and they're even sending your uh, new account ID, but we'll get into that uh, a bit later. Now, let's break it down a bit. I'm loading a web page in the Xiaomi, uh, in the MIUI browser that comes pre installed on all of the Android devices from Xiaomi. Well, whenever you do any kind of event inside the browser, they send a request to their endpoint, sa.api.whatever. SA comes from sensor anal analytics which is a minor company that's offering analytic services, but maybe it's just a naming coincidence, who knows? And you can see that there is a base64 request uh, coming right there. Now, uh, the domain is being registered in China and it points to some IPs in Alibaba's cloud infrastructure. Based on your location, the data ends up somewhere at these three IPs, at least uh, recently. Uh, if you're from Europe, it goes to Singapore. If you're from the States, it goes to the US. And if you're from Russia, it goes to Russia. Now to recap it a little bit, I got a new phone with no apps installed, only the browser. It did, they did more than 24 calls in three hours to their Chinese infrastructure. This is a bit worrying. So I started digging around a bit more because this is not the end of the story. So um, in order to validate if this is happening on uh, in other places, I needed to find the exact piece of code that is doing this and correlate it with the request to prove that they're doing this uh, from, uh, for all of the Xiaomi devices that they have. So if you remember this slide, we're gonna use it as an example. We have the data list parameter that's being used here to send to log the data. I pull the APK from the phone for the browser and decompiled it. And inside that APK, look for the same uh, variable, same data list. And I found it quick enough. There was only one reference. 
And this data list was in a function called send HTTP request. Then I took the HTTP request function and I started looking for references to it and hit another wrapper that would send the R7, use the R7 register and put some encode, uh, encoded data inside. Uh, I looked for the encoded da encode data function and found it with a lot of ease. Basically, it was right there in the open obfuscation or whatsoever. And this is how I basically found uh, a way to decode the data. It was just a uh, zip being done over the um, over the JSON with all of that uh, logged uh, information, and then they use Base64 on top of it and just send it over the wire. And after decoding it, uh, we can look into more detail at what they're saying. Sending it's the URL that you're visiting for any web page that you might visit inside their browser, the pre-installed browser and the default browser that's uh, on the phone. Um, the network type to which you're connected. But I guess this is pretty much a standard operation. Uh, device info, like the model, screen height with uh, and all of that uh, mumbo jumbo that's usually sent by basically everybody. And this is where it gets interesting. It's an UUID that they pr pretend to use as an anonymization service. So it's, they're saying that it, the data is anonymously sent because they use an UUID for all of this data and they're not sending anything uh, personal in the same request. But they also send your account ID, which is a MIUI ID in subsequent requests, which also contain that UUID that we were seeing before. Um, a MIUI ID is an ID that's, uh, that you use you, you have to create if you want to do anything on the phone, like use any Xiaomi service, like their Seam, their App Store. So most of the users would be tempted into uh, actually uh, creating one and leaving it there. And they even send whenever the user is in incognito mode. Um, of data in the incognito mode, at least initially. Now, just a bit of backtracking and emphasis on this distinct ID that appears in a lot of places, even in incognito mode, coupled with the UUID that I was telling you about, and the fact that you cannot create a new ID without your phone number or your email or your social media account. It's, it's impossible to, to, to get one unless you send any kind of uh, some personal information. Not to mention that, for example, if you want to unlock your bootloader on Xiaomi phones, you have to have a MIUI ID and you have to actually use a phone a bit in order to not get flagged by them that you are trying to do anything shady. Now, uh, one last recap. There, Xiaomi is sending the visited URLs, your browsing history, your search engine history, your browsing behavior, like how you are scrolling around on your phone and uh, uh, what, uh, how long the pages are taking to load and what you're seeing on the page. And all of them can be correlated to the real persona, to the real you, even though at a shallow glance, uh, they could say that, hey, but we're sending different requests. This is false. The personal request and the, uh, the, the requests that contain personal info and the requests that contain anonymized information overlap. So it's quite easy to figure out who is navigating those websites or uh, who is listening to that uh, censored music as we're gonna see in the future slides. 
And this happens even if in, in incognito mode. So they just disable, they disable sending of your MIUI ID that I was telling you about, but they still use the same UID. So you can still get tracked. But there is even more because this is not limited to their, uh, to only their browser. This happens system-wide inside MIUI. So I decided to just uh, browse around and look at some news. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you click any of the news items that they display in their news app, it's not only you that's looking at, at that article, it's also the comrade officer. Uh, and there, they could have sent like an SHA uh, or some kind of other hash in order to, I don't know, uh, get some kind of personal preferences when it comes to news and display any kind of smart suggestions or whatnot. Uh, but they are actually sending the title of the news item that you clicked, the name of the publication, uh, and a lot of other data. Of course, coupled with your MIUI ID and the UUID that I was telling you about. Um, now, I decided to listen to some uh, music in their uh, application that supports offline music playing. I like my music offline. Nobody can track you when you're listening to your music offline, right? Nope. They actually send all of the songs that you're playing inside their music player uh, that you downloaded. So don't imagine it's some kind of streaming service or whatever. No. They are sending the songs that you play and the videos that you watch in their app in real time. So, okay, like there's one more recap, um, but this is the last one. We have a, comp a company that's selling cheap phones that send the news you watch, the music you play offline, what are the uh, home screen, how your home screen folders are named. And this is this initially I didn't uh, I didn't notice, but remember some of the initial slide with twenty percent traffic uh, that I decrypted only a small part of it. This is how I found about that they are also tracking the name of the folders that you have on your home screen. They added some extra layers. Uh, of, of encryption on top of that. They didn't actually, they didn't use the same scheme just uh, zipping the JSON and sending it over the wire as B64. They use AES encryption with a proper IV, the key stored inside Android's key store somewhere around, and it differs from app to app and from session to session. So they really put a lot of effort into trying to hide the more invasive habits that they are uh, uh, doing from the prying eyes of researchers. And this is something that uh, is on my homework list. They use more complex encryption. So I guess the data should be even spicier than all of the stuff that I presented to you. Um, but yeah, I couldn't decrypt the other stuff that they are sending. So I just wanted to, uh, to see how, if they are, all of this data is being exfiltrated on all of the other uh, phones that they have. So I downloaded the firmware I used for four phones, the Xiaomi Mi 810, the K20, the Mi Mix 3, uh, and my Note. I use the uh, broadly extractor and as that to image in order to get a uh, system.img uh, file, which I then unpacked and I pulled all of the APKs and VDEXs from uh, the system.img. And 
all of them had this exact same code that I was telling you about. All of them were sending uh, uh, the information uh, to, to their servers. Uh, so I guess it's a, a systematic issue. It's not limited to certain budget phones. This was present even on their flagships. Um, and after I reported this to the press and uh, there was a bit of back and uh, from with their, uh, I don't know, PR team, I guess, that kept saying that they aren't doing anything wrong. They initially did, denied it vehemently. They were disappointed by the researchers investigating this, by the way, had tip to Cyber Gibbons for having my back. Um, after a few days, they started backing off a bit, still insisting that the users accepted their terms and conditions so they can send whatever they want, whenever they want. And finally, after a, a few more days, they released a patch and thanked us for our efforts. And fellow humans, I present you the patch. It's a toggle which allows you to enable or disable the enhanced incognito mode. And this is what it reads when we enable it or disable it. So if you want to go into incognito mode, what you would say that, hey, I am gonna enable incognito mode and enhanced incognito mode. And that's false because when you enhance your incognito experience, you're actually sending your data to their servers, which by the way is still not anonymized. It's quite a mess. Um, and it, it keeps going from bad to worse because I also have uh, one of their Xiaomi wristbands, which I paired to a Xiaomi phone and that was running their UI, their Android, MIUI. And by our powers combined, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Captain Spyware. So you thought that the 24 requests were bad in three hours. Um, we have 40 requests in, I guess, three minutes that uh, send a lot of aggregated data. Let's say that some of it is not that personal and you might need it for analyzing your sleep or whatever. Uh, but some of the requests are uh, pretty weird. I mean, they didn't even bother obfuscating it. Do you see something weird around here? They're actually sending the app names in the clear for all of the apps that uh, you have installed on your phone and you granted notification access to it even though a lot of other solutions could have been implemented, like uh, uh, I don't know, encrypting them a little bit. But it's not that bad, uh, even though we're quickly turning into one of those episodes from South Park, uh, Human Sent iPad, where uh, user, when vendors think that every user will read uh, an EULA and when they click agree, it means that they can just own the user. There are phones, for example, who don't do that. See this? This is an empty log. Nothing was being sent from a phone that surprisingly is made in China as well. It's an Oppo phone. So this is an Oppo phone, guys. Be like Oppo. Oppo is not sending anything at least uh, blatantly in view of me uh, to their servers. Um, and yeah, that was it. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, follow me on Twitter for any additional developments on this and on GitHub uh, because I'm gonna post uh, a write up at some point uh, on uh, of all of these shenanigans that I pulled. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, thanks, uh, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, don't forget to send me your slides also after, so I can purge them yes. on, the, on the actual uh, uh, GitHub. Um, while we're waiting for some questions uh, from the chat, 
so when, when did you publish that re uh, research again? Was it like a month, two months ago? Uh, I contacted a reporter about this uh, three weeks ago. Okay. Oh, wow. uh, beginning of May, I think. Yeah. And did you uh, hear any feedback so far from like uh, from vendors and like uh, from journalists or? Uh, yeah, the news spread like wildfire. Um, there were, let's say, divisive views, uh, divisive views. Some of them were saying, hey, everybody's doing that. Well, in that case, I present you what about ism, which is a pretty weak way of arguing against something. Uh, while others were pretty revolted on the privacy infringements that uh, Xiaomi is doing. Yeah, the, the, definitely that's pretty crazy if you think about it. Uh, is this the only vendor you looked at so far or did you look at other like, uh, for, I would say like, I, I don't want to say Asian vendors, but like non, like non, non vendors because like uh, Xiaomi is like, it's pretty big in terms of market share, right? I think they're also like super popular yes. in Africa, even in Europe. I mean, they provide like, or well, just talking yes. about it in the chat, no, like really good hardware for the price, but I guess you pay with your data, no, it makes more sense. Yeah, know? I mean, when uh, something is, when a product is free, you are the product. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, I did look, this is the first thing that I do when I get a new phone. Uh, and in my, I've noticed that Lenovo is doing something along these lines as well, sending your email correlated with the apps that you install and uninstall from your phone in real time. Um, but back then I didn't have that much time to focus on, uh, on, on things like this. Yeah, I see. And uh, someone is asking, actually, uh, do you have the list of all the domain names uh, that Jeremy is connecting to so they can add them to like a sinkhole, I mean, a pie hole? Uh, yes, I think that Costin already compiled a list of domains that you can just plug into pie holes. And, uh, somewhere buried in Twitter. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, by the way, like uh, whenever you uh, we put the slides on GitHub, if you want, you know, because it's just like a GitHub, you can just create a, a .md file and put the list of mm -hmm. domains there if you want, you know, to centralize yeah, like yeah. Uh, the information. Uh, definitely, because there's definitely a lot of people like uh, y using uh, using this. Um, and uh, out of curiosity, do you have any idea of what they do with the data? Do they even monetize it in some way, or is it just just like straight like? Uh, intelligence that they're gathering on users um so that sa uh, subdomain that they have is really interesting uh, and there was a lot of investigation done by the reporter to which i um uh, i whistleblow the the issue um there's a company called sensor analytics in china that and a lot of the API calls inside uh, inside the code are named Sensor Analytics API, Sensor Analytics, uh, this Sensor Analytics that. Which is the company you mentioned, right? Yes. So there is a pretty strong correlation between that analytics company and Xiaomi and other, let's say, actors in the Xiaomi board that have a lot of interest into companies that sell metadata, like browsing behaviors of users in general. I see. And so uh, I think is they there are any company you know about, or do you see like on a, a other companies like Sensor Analytics so far? Because like, I would yeah, assume I they have on... a website and everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a website and where they kind of. Uh, uh, advertise uh, things like this. Uh, I'm trying to find it actually. Oh, this, oh, China is using AI. Oh, Al Jazeera is blocked here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, are they based in China or in San Francisco? I see a company, but they're based in China. Uh, in uh, there should be, there should be in, uh, so yeah, sensor data. It's a oh, Chinese so. startup called Sensor Analytics. Okay. 
the ch yeah sensor analytics or or sensors data uh, it's a startup they acquired 44 million in round led up by an e new york equity firm okay uh, Xiaomi is oh, listed yeah. as a customer on Sensor Data's website. You can Sensors find more in. Sensor right? I think that's that website, yeah. Yes. Investment yes. Yes. Sector. Thomas Brewster did uh, some pretty solid uh, uh, oh, from Forbes, research yeah. on them. Yeah, from yeah. Forbes. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good. Like he's a, he's a one man army uh, at Forbes. Like he's uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking at all the stuff and uh, yeah. Okay, I found the found the website. I will have a look after. Looks uh, looks pretty good. Uh, well, uh, oh, one more question from the chat actually. So we talked about the Chinese brand and uh, Xiaomi, but what about like uh, like uh, Apple? And I guess we can extend it to like Samsung and everything because they're also like uh, Android based. Like, do they do like similar tracking? We don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen them doing anything like that. Uh, now with Apple, I have I don't use Apple devices in general. Yeah. Um, and, but whenever I would do any kind of capture, let's say for work, and just try to to see some app traffic, uh, Apple devices are pretty quiet in general. But don't take my word for it. Uh, I am just a rookie when it comes to reversing Apple products. Uh, Samsung, I haven't seen Samsung sending anything of interest as well. And I have at least on the browser part. Um, and I think that pixels have been bashed so much by security researchers and they're just a workhorse that has no secrets right now. Yeah, no, they definitely. Uh, it would be interesting actually to, uh, to compile a list of like data analytics company, like, uh, in different countries. Because at the yes. end of the day, like uh, if if we just kind of like look at the uh, software where it goes to, that's one way to look at it. But if you just like make a list of VCs uh, from different country and like, or even if you just go on Crunchbase for like data analytics and you just, just kind of narrow down results and see uh, which uh, customers they have, that's also a, a potential way of finding like similar, uh, because I would assume like they have multiple customers, for instance, that company. Yeah. yeah. Data is the new gold. Yeah, definitely. Especially given the price of oil now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what What about the OnePlus actually? Uh, I I I never had the OnePlus on my hands, unfortunately. When they were cheap, uh, there was this long queue, and I'm just an impulsive buyer. I just get them on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, but uh, so and now they're pretty expensive and actually pretty premium. So uh, I never had the chance, unfortunately, to bump my head into, uh, into one. Yeah, it's a pretty good uh, research project. If you can buy your device for like 200 pounds, you know, like 150 pounds and uh, be able to do research, yeah. it's pretty cool. It's like way more. Um, yeah. Well, cool. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, thanks again uh, for your time. And uh, well, don't leave us since you're going to be uh, with us on the panel after. Uh, Looking for, forward to that and uh, yeah, and uh, while uh, Costin is going to get ready to share his uh, screen, uh, I'm going to give you uh, a small uh, uh, reminder of like uh, join the Discord. So the address is on uh, on top here and uh, if you're on twitter don't hesitate to use the hashtag that you see i guess here and uh yeah and if you have any like uh speakers or like any presentation that you have seen like lately uh please like uh, make re make recommendation like uh, like i was saying like this whole theme around mobile tracking was a recommendation of costing and uh it's quite uh well timed because uh with all the uh tracking like uh, being like the top one uh, discussion now especially when it comes to to mobile uh as someone who is not doing like mobile research at all you know i kind of feel like i've missed the bot because everything is like uh, mo mobile oriented uh but uh yeah
uh but at least it's good i don't have to uh, write blog posts and stuff anymore i just have a, a youtube uh, channel where i can uh, invite people like costin to uh, talk about uh, cool stuff <laughs> okay uh let's get ready for the next uh, presentation from costin about uh sharing screen, sharing the cam, everything looks good. Please let me know if everything looks good. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matt. And uh, good evening. Good morning, everybody. Um, yet another opcode, uh, virtual opcode conference. And uh, uh, topic today, obviously, mobile trackers, and in particular, I would like to uh, go a bit, uh, say, underground. We want to see a, a bit how all this uh, mobile tracking works uh, in a more generic way. Uh, we've all seen uh, Mr. Hook looking at a specific brand of phones. My research was more in the line of uh, applications that everybody, uh, including you, the listeners or the viewers, might have on your phones right now. So with no further ado, um, I will get into it. This whole research actually started uh, in December 2019 when I read an article in the New York Times. And this article, you know, it kind of uh, uh, shake, shaken all the fibers uh, in my body. This article called uh, One Nation Tracked. And this is actually an investigation from the New York Times. They managed to get a database, a very large database of uh, uh, locations that were collected uh, by one of these uh, analytics companies. New York Times doesn't actually name which company uh, this data came from, but uh, they say that uh, the data included um, a few billion uh, endpoints. And for instance, the data included the more than 10,000 uh, smartphones that were being tracked uh, as they were hovering around the Central Park in New York. Um, you could actually, based on the IDs that were associated with this data, you can actually pinpoint to one single phone. And from there, you can track the movements of that particular phone um, pretty much, let's say, all over the city. So for instance, this is one of these phones from uh, the uh, Central Park, and they actually see that uh, it uh, beaconed, uh, it sent uh, these telemetry pings back to the, uh, uh, well, unknown uh, company uh, throughout the period, let's say, of a couple of time. Uh, and uh, as uh, New York Times uh, puts it, connecting those pings actually reveals a diary of uh, that person's life. You can actually see how they're moving around. Um, obviously, the points with the largest number of pings, they are actually things like their home or maybe their work office or their family or even, uh, let's say, places where they take lunch or they buy their coffee uh, and so on, which is, of course, very, very interesting. Now, uh, um, New York Times actually tried to go a bit deeper into this subject, and uh, all the data is pretty much anonymized. But again, as uh, Hook showed us, that these anonymization IDs can sometimes be de-anonymized. In this, um, this particular case, uh, New York Times were quite easily able, they say, uh, to identify and track important people. So, for instance, they followed military officials with security clearances as they drove home at night, or they tracked law enforcement officers as they took their kids to school, or even, uh, you know, important rich lawyers and their guests that they traveled uh, from private jets to vacation properties. And all this tracking actually came from looking at a data set uh, of supposedly anonymized data where every single uh, smartphone on the map is in essence just a unique ID. Uh, and 
Of course, you might be wondering, how can a unique ID disclose somebody's identity? How can you actually find out who is behind that dot? And this is actually what the New York Times, they did and they actually managed to identify some of the people uh, and uh, they show their names in this article again with their permission. So for instance, one case is uh, Mary Melbourne, which is a singer and she performed for various uh, United States presidents, including uh, President Trump. Um, how they tracked her? Well, they were, uh, well, let's say, we can kind of guess the method they used, but they knew that she basically sang at uh, Trump's uh, inauguration. And then you can just, let's say, find a few other events where she was supposed to be singing. And you just look for any ID in the data set that was present at all these different events. So uh, actually, she's saying that she was quite careful about limiting how um, she shared her location. And she couldn't uh, actually name the application that might have collected this information. Uh, in other case, uh, they uh, basically tracked the Microsoft uh, engineer that, uh, well, he made a visit one Tuesday afternoon to a Microsoft competitor, Amazon. And then the following month, he started a new job at Amazon. So it took, let's say, minutes to identify him as Ben Broily, uh, a manager now uh, with Amazon Prime Air. So the ideas uh, that these uh, anonymized user IDs, you know, can um, provide, let's say, a very strong shield from unmasking people's identities is not true. And as um, the New York Times uh, shows, it's actually quite possible to turn these uh, anonymized IDs into real people's identities. And New York Times, they actually go ahead and they list some of the companies who are working uh, in this location uh, data business. Uh, of course, in addition to the one that we uh, saw, uh, there's, let's say, quite a few of them. And um, there is probably no doubt that this is a very, very uh, productive and uh, growing business at the moment. And I'm sure the number of these companies is actually quite uh, larger. There's probably I don't know, 10 times more companies uh, who are involving themselves uh, in the development of such uh, libraries. All right, so um, let's talk a bit about why this might be a problem. Now, um, when I was much younger, um, the uh, director of marketing in the company that I was working came to me after a talk and he said, hey, Kostin, I want to ask you one thing. I said, yeah, sure. And what? And he said, please don't use the word problem anymore. Um, you know, in, in the world today, there are no problems. Um, there's actually only opportunities. So I'm going to call this not the problem, but I'm going to call this uh, the opportunity. So what? It's different companies who are engaging in uh, location collection. So actually, uh, just to be entirely fair, would be nice to look at both the positive uh, and potentially negative uses of these tracking technologies. So just let's say a few points on the positive side. For instance, uh, we could use all this location information to uh, identify what are, let's say, the most uh, crowded routes and then to improve transportation systems uh, to make them more efficient. Uh, we can also use this to study epidemics and how uh, you know uh, people move or don't move during uh, things like natural disasters, pandemics, um, testing the uh, efficacy of social distancing, for instance, can be another application. Uh, do all these guidelines from the government actually work and which people follow these guidelines, which percentage of the population is actually compliant. Uh, Let's say there can be even you know, further uses for this, such as, for instance, tracking criminals or crimes that were produced at certain hours in various locations. So if you know that, let's say, a crime occurred at 3 a.m. and seven minutes uh, in a particular place, you can go ahead and try to see which phones were actually in the area at that time 
and then to try to identify the criminals. And this is actually happening at the moment, and we've seen this happen um, in various ways, either through the tower locations or through things such as uh, uh, the police uh, uh, supporting uh, companies such as Google for the data. Unfortunately, there's also uh, potential abuses of these technologies. One a very good example here can be tracking journalists uh, and their sources. So the journalists, they can meet with whistleblowers and uh, somebody with access to uh, such data can very easily identify those journalists and then to try to identify their sources and uh, unmask them. Um, this can be used for the purpose of stalkerware, such as stalking celebrities, for instance, or all sorts of abuses, such as keeping tabs on employees. And, you know, kind of to just to summarize or to draw the line and put everything into just one bucket, um, there's a wonderful book from Shoshana Zubov called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism that I advise you all to uh, buy and uh, read because it's a very interesting book. And in essence, all this information can actually be turned into money um, if you know how. And if you know how to use this information, this can actually be turned into loads of money. So <clears throat> just to summarize, we have both opportunities and risks here. Uh, and there's no problem. Again, there's no problem with this. Again, we need to look from the point of view of an opportunity. All right, so in March, uh, to be honest, this story from the New York Times, um, it kind of feels that uh, it passed. So obviously there were people reading, uh, there were people worrying about it, but then, you know, two days later, everybody forgot about it. And that is the sad things um, about these big stories nowadays and that we see them and then in a couple of days, everybody forgets. So in March 2020, I saw quite an interesting uh, video uh, on Twitter from a company called um, Tectonics. And uh, they have a quite very impressive technology, I, I must say. Um, and uh, why don't we try actually to watch this video together? And I have sound uh, in it as well. And I, I really hope that works. I'll go quiet for a moment while you all watch the movie. We wanted to see the true footprint social gatherings like spring break beach crowds could really have on our society in the face of a global pandemic. To do so, we started with the big picture, powering our engine with billions of anonymized location data points from mobile devices across the globe. Using tectonics, we can then zoom in on specific regions. Here, we focus specifically on just one beach in Fort Lauderdale during the month of March. Again, each of these data points shown on the map corresponds to a unique mobile device active on a given day. You can see clearly that device activity spikes during the two-week stretch of early to mid-March corresponding with spring break. No surprise. Now, using an analysis called a spider query, we can actually track movement of these devices over the remaining weeks of March, seeing where these devices went after spring breakers left the beach. As we zoom further and further out, it becomes clear just how massive the potential impact just one single beach gathering can have in spreading this virus across our nation. It can be hard for us to realize sometimes just how connected our world really is until the data tells the stories that we just can't see. All right. So uh, just as a disclaimer, I absolutely agree uh, with the conclusion of this video, which is that uh, um, social distancing really works, but the potential um, of all this to uh, uh, you know, turn the, uh, the spreading of COVID into a nightmare is there. So of course that there's many companies out there who have uh, in pitching their technologies and how they can be used for the purpose of uh, tracking the uh, COVID-19 spread. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but one of the interesting things was uh, here uh, in the beginning in this interface, you see the amount of, uh, uh, well, uh, telemetry uh, points they have, and there was about 13 billion telemetry points. All right. 
after this video, to be honest, there were a couple of questions uh, kind of unanswered. And for instance, uh, one of them uh, came from Colin Anderson, uh, who's a researcher that I respect a lot. And he uh, wrote on Twitter uh, a question, where do you get your location data? Are you the first party for any of these apps? And what are the specific methods for anonymization? So kind of, let's say this question also triggered uh, my interest. And especially I thought that uh, if Colin doesn't know the answer to these questions, um, maybe it's actually a topic worth researching. So one of the things that attracts your attention in this um, uh, post was the fact that they said a partnership with XML Social. And if you remember the New York Times article, it's actually, there's XML right there in this uh, selection of companies who are working in the location data business. So the things, you know, they kind of connect. Uh, here we go, we have another example, practical example of uh, how the data, the telemetry and location data is uh, getting collected and how it can actually be used. Uh, in this case, why not for very uh, good purposes? Uh, of course, from my point of view, the first question that came to my mind when I, when I saw this is, uh, am I a ship? Am I one of the points in these graphics? Well, uh, is my phone or are my phones actually uh, running some of these applications, sending the telemetry uh, 24 seven to their developers and further being sold through different networks to other entities and so on and so on. Uh, the only issue is how to check, how to find out if actually any of the apps on my phone um, do send telemetry. Um, actually, if you go to the XMOD website, uh, they have a uh, easy to integrate SDK. And uh, if you look there, uh, they kind of recommend app developers to integrate this ad-free um, SDK and basically get a revenue stream out of it, which means you're gonna get uh, paid in money for binding this SDK in your uh, smartphone app. And there's no advertisement. Like what are the most annoying things about free smartphone apps? Those are the ads. In this case, there's no ads, so that's good. And actually there's a monthly earning calculator there. And I put uh, two random numbers. I said like, my app has uh, 1,000 uh, United States users and I have 1,000 global users. And for that, the potential revenue uh, calculated by this uh, small uh, web page app is $33 per month, which comes actually from <clears throat> about three cents per user in the United States and 0 0.3 cents for the users outside of the United States. So basically, if you're in the States, uh, your privacy is uh, worth about 3 cents per user. If you live like myself somewhere else, like Romania, your privacy is worth about 0 0.3 cents per month. Um, and the good news is that it's quite easy actually to install this um, SDK in your app. Uh, it is a quite efficient, uh, battery efficient location collection software. So at this point, I was saying to myself, this is wonderful. How do I get the SDK? I need this SDK for myself so that I can see how it works so that I can check if any applications on my phone actually have this SDK integrated. So. Uh, there's an FAQ on the XMOD website and there is a couple of questions. Uh, does your SDK impact the user interface? No, it's all in the background. So that means it's invisible. Does it affect the battery life? Well, typically one to 3% battery drain. How large is it? Half a meg. And uh, is this legal? This is a very, very important question. Is this legal? And uh, the answer is most definitely. Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, they all monetize on their data one way or another. And without GDPR compliant SDK, we make sure everything is kosher. So everything looks good from this point of view, let's say.
but the question remains, how can we find the SDK? Um, now, with a bit of searching on Google, actually I came by a website uh, on GitHub where somebody has a source code for a um, smartphone app, uh, an Android app called Smart Speedometer. And actually I noticed that there was a small line in there. Uh, you see it is uh, xmode SDK dot in it. Uh, it's commented out, meaning that, uh, well, he removed this from the source code before making it public, maybe because he is not allowed to publish the SDK. Uh, but nevertheless, this kind of gave me an idea. What if we try to find other applications which have this uh, Xmode SDK dot in it in them? So I turned to my favorite uh, Yara hunting platform, so, uh, which is a virus total malware intelligence. He put together a very simple Yara rule uh, that just has one string in there, which is X mode SDK. I fire up the rule, I waited the bet, and I got 29 matches for that. And uh, there's also 500 other matches for the pro users. I, to be honest, I'm not a pro user myself, I'm just a regular user, but even in that situation, 29 matches are just enough to get me started. So I took effectively the, uh, you know, in alphabetical order by hash, I took the first hash from there and I started looking into it a bit to see uh, what it does. So this is a uh, an application for Android. And the nice thing about VirusTotal, it actually, um, it shows you a bit of behavior, how this application behaves. And there's a bunch of URLs that this application tried to contact. For instance, uh, there's one signal. And I was wondering if this one signal is actually the X mode SDK, but somehow it doesn't sound. So at this point, I don't see anything in there which is X mode related, but I looked at the permissions for this Android app and uh, we have uh, access to the find location, which in other words is saying that it tries to get your exact location through the GPS. So this looks good. It means that uh, whatever we found here has the potential to be interesting. So I opened this in my favorite uh, viewer, uh, which is uh, Hugh. And as I was looking a bit through um, uh, the DEX file, this is basically classes.dex. I did search for X mode in there, and I did find, well, as you can see in there, X mode SDK.java, X mode service, and so on, and then a bunch of base 64 encoded strings. And uh, immediately this attracted my attention. I thought, obviously, the telemetry endpoints must be encrypted in a way so you can't easily see them in the binary, uh, which make sense, um, which is also why we can't immediately see anything like, uh, I don't know, xmode.com in the binary. Uh, but these strings, these base 64 encoded strings, they looked very interesting to me. And I had the feeling that they are uh, encrypted in a very poor fashion. So I took them into CyberChef, um, one of them. Then I just applied the base 64 decode and then I applied the XOR brute force. And immediately there's something in there which attracts uh, your attention and that's a plain text URL, atbbearclaw.com and so on. So I went there to check uh, the who is record for bear cloud. There's like uh, who is privacy protected, 500 uh, days old. If you go to the website, it says, welcome to Nginx. If you ping the exact endpoint, actually you get a response. So that means that the website is operational and the endpoint for, for this actually works, um, which is all quite interesting. Later I did a search on Google and I was able to find the research from uh, Checkpoint and this uh, uh, research from Checkpoint actually talks about an Android app uh, fraud, the uh, bear cloud and Haken clickers. So there you go, I just discovered uh, a clicker that was embedded in the application, which is all very interesting, but sadly, it's not what we were looking for. So I took another string. Well, honestly speaking, I decrypted all of them. Here's another example. This one decodes to udata elephantdata.net, 
what's that? We can go to their website and we see that Elephant Data is a company that wants to build a better business through big data. Elephant Data provides market intelligence solutions and app analytics to help you win your market. Interesting, interesting, but still not the X mode SDK that we were looking for. Now I keep looking. At this point, I just um, decompiled the entire APK. And one of the things in there, which was called P014IO, actually it does have inside uh, a function which is uh, called initialize if granted permissions. And this is part of the X mode SDK class. So bingo, we found the X mode SDK class. So as I kept looking around, uh, trying to see exactly all the data, where the data is going, I discovered that actually it was going in plain text to this uh, Amazon Web Services uh, address, uh, which is not obfuscated or anything. So everything is in plain text. And I did check in the library to see what kind of data is going there. And this actually can be found uh, by jumping through a few classes, location intent service, which uses fetch data utils, which in the end uses location X mode. And this um, function actually collects a couple of things such as the altitude, latitude, longitude, bearing time, speed, accuracy, uh, battery level, um, then a few other network related identifiers, including the Wi-Fi SSIDs which is all kind of interesting information, which is collected again whenever there's a location change uh, notification. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering, what did we analyze here? Well, this is a application that is called the Snow Day Calculator. So you need to input your location or zip code, and then you get some predictions for it. If you check it on Google Play, uh, the people are not very happy with it, unfortunately. As one guy here commenting that, uh, well, he had the app for a while, but then he opened the phone and uh, the phone said that the app was a virus and this never happened to him before. If we look a bit further, we see that uh, there's about 5,000 installs for this application. So just to summarize again, what we saw inside just one application, there's the X mode SDK in there. There's bear cloud, there's elephant data. There's one signal. I, we didn't check that. Remember, that we saw it in the telemetry. And potentially, there's a few others. But well, at this point, I decided to write a better Yara. So I just took this particular telemetry endpoint. Uh, I wrote the Yara. I ran it again on Virustoto. This time, this gave me 2019 matches and plus 4,000 other pros. And I was able to connect these to about 240 unique applications, uh, application names that are available through app stores such as Google Play. Um, obviously, I didn't analyze all of them by hand, so I tried to do some statistics to better understand what's inside this application. So for instance, I wanted to see what are the most uh, common strings in this application. So for instance, um, what we see here, things like example.com, uh, Wikipedia, Google, uh, plus Google.com. There we have app measurement, and that measurement is another uh, telemetry SDK. You see it in there with 1,170 hits. And then, you know, a few others uh, in there. So what is potentially, let's say, more interesting is the number of installs. So I did a bit of scripting in there. I took pretty much uh, all these uh, applications. So I did some scripting to uh, try to get the number of installs from the Google Play Store for every single one of them. So for instance, there's one of these applications which has over 10 million installs. And uh, if you look there at the interactive elements, it shares your location. Uh, and it has in-app purchases. So sharing your location, 10 million installs, uh, quite interesting. So I pretty much counted everything together to see how many applications uh, we have in total and how many potential installs. And the number that I came up is about uh, half a billion installs with a very, let's say, small footnote in there, which is that this is the theoretical number of max installs if all the installs are unique. 
and in my opinion most likely they are not unique meaning um, if there's two applications each one with 10 million installations then there's a good chance that it's not 10 million people and 10 million people but it's quite possible that 5 million people have both applications at the same time which is why i say up to half a billion installs well nevertheless if you combine everything together the smallest number was uh, over 100 million installations so i think that that is still significant so well just to summarize and a few conclusions um, there's practically hundreds of uh, free and paid smartphone apps which are uh, linked with this mobile sdks to collect your location and uh, well is this legal most definitely as you can see as you have seen there on the xmod website actually i think there's uh, some discussion around this topic that in reality there's no laws which regulate how this information can be collected or used uh, what is for sure it is true that this data could be used for good purposes but at the same time it can also be used for let's call them other purposes and we have just uh, one one application there that was linked to half a dozen sdk and why why is this happening well obviously all the app developers they want to maximize their profits so they link together different sdks they don't link just one they link all of them so that's like 33 dollars multiplied six from you know six different sdks so in reality the location goes not to just one but to many different uh, of these analytic uh, companies and I have uh, the feeling that the COVID-19 tracing apps will likely kind of increase and contribute uh, this location uh, collection business in the future. So what about solutions for these um, opportunities? Well, if you've seen my story, uh, one about catching APTs at home, uh, how to tap your home internet, one of the first things I did was to check my uh, internet logs for that particular endpoint. And I was happy to discover there was no traffic from any of my phones to that endpoint. The reason being that I don't have any of those 240 applications installed on my phone. Um, I put together a list. Uh, you can find it on GitHub, github.com and mobile trackers, which is a repository of all the telemetry endpoints uh, that I collected uh, by analyzing different apps. And that includes the ones uh, that uh, Hook uh, found uh, and shared with me as well. So what do you need for this? Uh, basically to run it in an efficient way, um, you need PyHole, obviously. Um, how, how do you get around the problem of, um, uh, let's say doing this when you're also outside your home, right? Uh, one idea is for instance, to install WireGuard and set up a VPN server at your home. And then always when you travel or when you're outside, uh, connect to this VPN profile that uses your own custom DNS server with PyHole at home. Uh, and I guess that we're probably wondering uh, if the story is over. Actually, the story continues. Um, yesterday, uh, Guardian Firewall which by the way was one of the applications uh, that allows you to track all this um, telemetry. They posted on Twitter that uh, the new updated apps with the XMO social uh, SDK, they're using a new telemetry endpoint, which is API my endpoint.io. So I guess this at some point can become a kind of a um, cat and mouse game identifying telemetry endpoints, changing them, identifying new ones, and so on and so on. So I'll leave you with the, with these thoughts. Uh, again, um, thank you very much. And uh, there's two QR codes in there. I'll let you discover where these uh, QR codes uh, go by yourselves. And I hope that this was uh, interesting and make sure guys do check uh, if you are a sheep, or if you are not a ship, I think that is a question. <laughs> thanks uh, for the presentation, uh, Kostin, and thanks uh, for joining us back for, is this the third time you, that you're speaking? <laughs> <laughs> it could be, yes, could be. Yeah. A, a out of five edition. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, sorry we're, about we're gonna that, start but... to get complaints, you know, like uh... <laughs> yeah, people get tired of uh, me and my headphones. Everybody complaining about the green headphones, but I like them. <laughs> But it's uh, it's better than uh, most of headphones. Uh, at least the microphone is pretty good. Uh, so quick questions from the audience. Uh, so a question from Tara. Does Kostin agree with Shoshana Zuboff felt that the tensions between uh, privacy and surveillance during COVID are positive because they force people to consider what they are willing to live with? Hmm. That's That's a nice question. I, I haven't heard about uh, this opinion. I didn't know that uh, Shoshana is still uh, commenting on the topic. Uh, come to think of uh, probably yes, I guess that this brings the topic of privacy into attention and people are more and more worried about it. Um, well, uh, everybody is pretty much, let's say, uh, stuck at home with a lot of time to think. So this is uh, when people are stuck and uh, thinking about things that's probably when uh, uh, there's changes or there's let's say positive changes yeah actually there's a comment in in the chat from uh from a man who is uh, saying everyone today will accept being tracked for healthy reasons today or tomorrow to prevent future pandemic uh, unfortunately there are the new norm today that evolve uh, so fast from the past so there is Yaga, uh, who was uh, one of the participants in the disinformation roundtable, who is disagreeing. Although uh, I do remember that Bo Schneier published a blog post not too long ago, uh, where he was saying like mobile applications, uh, like to track people is a dumb idea, and that there is probably like two ways that people would uh, accept to be uh, under surveillance, and uh, health is uh, w w one of them. Uh, I think it was Bruce uh, Schneier, if I remember correctly. It's an interesting theory. Health and maybe security, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? Which is what's happening for the past uh, 20 years, right? 19 years. And it's working pretty well. Uh, <laughs> Jaziel. <laughs> Costin is the C in Opcode. <laughs> and hopefully the O. Oh, yeah. But the O is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good one, actually. Um, <laughs> da -da -da, let's scroll down. Uh, question. Besides swapping our smartphones with not so smartphone ones, is there a way to minimize uh, our previous exposure? Um, well, I would say that uh, well, swapping the smartphones with not so smartphones is uh, unfortunately is not a solution for almost everybody, right? So I guess that uh, there's uh, solutions like the ones I showed. You can um, try to put together lists of these telemetry endpoints, your own custom VPNs. There's even commercial solutions, to be honest. I, the one that I mentioned, the Guardian Firewall, there's another one called uh, Lockdown. It just allow you to, to do exactly that. Um, there's also another suggestion in the chat that I see that you could uh, use the eFoundation uh, OS. Um, sure, that's another solution. Again, the only uh, kind of worrying part is the kind of applications that you have on the phone. So uh, the uh, eFoundation phones, they, you know, they can come kind of empty. You think you even need to install some kind of uh, camera photo app and the one that is open source is not as good as the ones that uh, come uh, with the original hardware uh, but otherwise uh, yeah um, just uh, think about things such as um, graphene os for instance running on uh, google pixels but uh, not on the uh, pixel 4 right <laughs> not on the pixel on 4 the old unfortunately yeah. yeah i hope uh, i hope they they port it to the Pixel 4 uh, soon because it's it's a good choice, it's a solid choice. Again, you still depend on the apps. And the question is, um, how many of the apps that you have on your phone, be it whatever, let's say Android, iOS phone, even eFoundation or Graphene, actually send telemetry uh, with things such as the cell ID or the Wi-Fi SSIDs or Bluetooth and so on. Uh, to unknown telemetry endpoints. Yeah, 
I mean, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing in the chat, you know, like uh, Yaga and Sima are saying uh, we need to invite uh, Greco back to discuss about the uh, OPSEC and to, <laughs> <laughs> to see what would be the, the best way of uh, like uh, avoiding, uh, I guess, uh, invasive surveillance uh, in 2020. Uh, I mean, I personally re generally use like a, a Nokia as uh, my main phone. Uh, but the main reason is like everyone thinks it's because of security, because they know me, but it's just because the battery lasts longer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's check if there is any more questions. Um, this is a whole debate on Privacy is becoming irrelevant. It's not, uh, yeah, yeah, to paraphrase uh, Luke Skywalker, amazing everything you just said is wrong. So, so not everyone will accept being tracked. And <laughs> even those, we will want some uh, assurance that only location data is tracked. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's going to be a good uh, transition for our uh, next panel, I guess. Um, I'm just going to launch the uh, transitions while everyone is uh, getting ready and uh, we can, uh, you guys can get ready for the uh, transition. Hi guys and welcome back for uh, a new uh, Upcut. Uh, I hope you're subscribed uh, to the channel. It's much easier than sending mailing list, actually, to be honest. Uh, I, I would say that the main reason uh, that I would say, like, you guys should subscribe. Uh, and while I'm getting the cameras ready and trying to find something to talk about, uh, yeah, definitely don't forget to use the hashtag. All the slides uh, are going to be available on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to check the materials after, it's going to be on uh, GitHub. And uh, also, uh, the presentations, obviously, because it's live, it's already available on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, but we're also going to cut the videos like we usually do and put everything in a separate playlist. So if you missed it, and if you're just watching a replay now, uh, that would be uh, one of the main reasons. Uh, so I'm particularly excited about the uh, next uh, round table, which should be like uh, pretty fun actually. And uh, so we have uh, three guests uh, for that round table. So two of them uh, you just met, so Gabriel and Costin and the uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think people are gonna like the uh, the top tank, uh, Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 pretty epic. Uh, and uh, Elliot, who is a French security researcher, uh, I guess everyone is gonna wonder if you're gonna be uh, if Rami Malek is gonna be coming uh, on the on the thing, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess that's uh, that's pretty much it. I'm just launching the transition again, and uh, while well, we get ready, and that's it. Hi guys, uh, thanks for joining us. So let's uh, let's check if everything is okay. I think everything is okay. And uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for joining us. So we have uh, Gabriel uh, Elliot. I don't know if you want us to call you uh, Elliot or if you want uh, to use. Uh, Baptiste your... is okay. Baptiste, okay, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and obviously, Costin, we just uh, talked about uh, yeah. uh, the um, what was the name of the SDK again? X mod? No. X mod SDK. X, X mod SDK, and that's uh, that's pretty interesting actually. Like, uh, I mean, is, I guess it's kind of like uh, we can just like start now, but uh, it, it's pretty hard to track uh, like uh, what apps are doing. Um, in general so 
for instance, there is this SDK that you have found. Uh, have you guys heard of any other SDKs doing like something similar publicly or because it's obviously not necessarily, necessarily like SDKs, but we have seen, for instance, like uh, uh, voice over IP, like applications being rebranded uh, because they got purchased by a VC and sold to another country. Uh, so it's a bit like harder to to keep track of it. But what about SDKs? Have you seen that in uh, in many places? Or well, um, speaking from uh, from what I've seen, um, as I said, there's like uh, dozens and dozens of uh, these SDKs that people just uh, link into their smartphone apps for small profits, like you know, thirty, three hundred dollars per month, something like this. Uh, from having 10,000 users is quite possible there. But again, there's dozens and dozens of these SDKs and uh, it's uh, probably quite complicated to keep track of all the endpoints and to um, see, uh, let's say, which applications uh, do that and which do not. It's even worse that sometimes you confuse them with malware or adware as well. They just behave really shady and you end yeah. up diving really weird rabbit holes. Well, this is especially the case with the bear claw the thing that I showed that, uh, well, the checkpoint uh, researchers uh, called the clicker and they talk in depth about how this, uh, you know, uh, does uh, click fraud in essence. So uh, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of borderline research and, uh, as I was saying, there's no strong laws that say or regulate uh, how this information can be collected, stored, transferred, uh, and so on. And there, there is also something else. Uh, using a SDK in order to get some analytics about your users is something quite common when you develop an Android application. So there is a limit, and the limit is difficult to uh, to drone because you don't know uh, sometimes uh, uh, analytics company will get a lot of data in order to profile the user but uh, the amount of data is is quite big so some company as costing show are getting the location in order to sell a product behind that but sometimes it's just an analytics company which are giving the ability to the developer to to profile the user and to target uh, some news or some features some specific feature to their users so this is something quite common even in the development process for for an android developer or mobile developers in, in general Absolutely, and actually I've seen uh, these apps uh, sending uh, kind of debug logs back uh, uh, to their developers. Uh, things like, you know, if they crash, if something unexpected happens, uh, there's uh, all these SDKs are just one signal, I guess, that allows the uh, passing of uh, information from the app back to the developers uh, almost in real time. So yeah, not all of them do track your location, but I guess the ones that track your location are the most, let's say, uh, uh, opportunistic. And uh, well, obviously, like we just uh, saw in Gabriel's uh, presentation, location is not the only data that uh, can be also uh, exfiltrated. Like uh, uh, you're saying like the browser history, like the music, uh, actually quick question. I just remembered, uh, that was for Mazin in the chat, uh, regarding the history, was it only if you're using the official web browser or also if you use like Chrome or Braver? They only did it using the browser that was prepackaged in, uh, in MIUI. Okay. So, uh, oh, and I forgot fun fact. It also happens on the browser that's. Uh, that they published on various stores as well. I see. And um, so speaking of uh, the different apps uh, you guys have been lo looked at, so uh, Gabriel and uh, Kostin, so you, you, you had the, the time to give a full presentation. Uh, but uh, Baptist, uh, you, you have been uh, quite uh, popular in the Indian community uh, over the past uh, few weeks. Can you uh, like summarize uh, for us and our audience uh, what you have been um, uh, 
uh, like this, uh, well, basically what uh, were your findings at what you did with uh, uh, our uh, Gear C2? I mean, I don't know if I'm pronouncing yeah. it right. Actually, someone in the chat was also asking about it. So, so India recently uh, published an a contact tracing application like many countries um, in order to fight COVID-19. And this application is getting regularly uh, the the Bluetooth, uh, the Bluetooth ID of people around you, and also is getting the GPS location um, regularly. So two months ago, uh, just after the launch of the application, I decided to look at it. So I found the first uh, security issue, which was not a very big issue. I mean, between maybe low and medium. Uh, basically, uh, web view activity was exported, so it was possible for an external attacker to open this web view activity and to read the internal file uh, of the application. So they fix it in the, in the version just after, uh, without any communication, they just fix it. And uh, recently, like one week ago or two weeks ago, I uh, looked back at the application and I found, so there is, a, there is a feature inside the application which gives the ability to the users to know how many people are infected by COVID-19 around you. So you have the ability to say, I want to know how many people are infected in a circle with the radius of uh, 500 meters, one kilometers, 10, uh, two, five of, 10 kilometers. And this, uh, when I looked at these features, the, the, uh, the request made by the application, there was no restriction at all in the parameters. So you were able to set the location of your choice, but also you were able to, to, uh, to set the radius of the circle you want to look at to something very, very small, like uh, 100 meters. So it gives you the, the lack of uh, restriction and also the, the ability to, uh, to do a lot of requests give, uh, gave me the ability to know who is uh, sick in this particular house, for example, or in this, uh, in this famous places like the Pal parliament, uh, the Indian parliament or the, the PMO, the prime minister office, uh, in India. So I was able to see that, for example, two people were infected in the PM office, something like, th something like that. So it was more a privacy issue. It was a way to abuse the functionality inside the application. Uh, so it was quite fun. I wrote a small write-up about it and the, it literally blew up. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, the, the communication phase and the uh, I got a lot of new followers in India, a lot of comments, a lot of press release. So I try to do my best to explain what it is. And um, after that, I worked also on some. I worked also on some um, on some dashboard because in India they decided to release each cities decided to release uh, some maps with the location of people infected by COVID-19 with their personal data. So there is a big work in general uh, at the country level to, uh, to, to spread the, the message that privacy is important. If you are sick, you still have some rights. You still have the right to have a privacy. And uh, there is a medical secret in France, for example. And so this secret is for good reason, uh, because if, for example, you uh, people around you know that you are infected by COVID-19, you can uh, the, uh, uh, you can have some some discrimination. You can be discrimi uh, discriminate uh, because of your health status. Um, it's funny the uh, mentioning uh, just to jump on that the uh, uh, medical secret in France, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, when was that? Weren't they giving like uh, 
like 25 euros for like each people they would report uh, back to the government to uh, medical doctors to all the GPs in France so the uh, because even like Macron said like this is a, a sanitary uh, war yes so uh, that's this... like a question mark around the medical secret uh, no I guess this is this is quite a big topic and this is uh this is why there is a hot debate around the contact tracing in general, uh, mobile uh, contact tracing application, but also manual contact tracing, because in order to fight a pandemic, you need to trace the contact of infected people. And in order to trace the contacts, you need to uh, uh, you need to go inside this privacy. And for example, in Taiwan, if I remember correctly, they decided to look at the bank accounts. They decided to look at the CCTV or at the phone records in order to know exactly where you want the last 14 days. So it's in France, we as a government try to do something in the middle. Uh, but yes, it's a violation of the medical secret because if doctors uh, send to a non-health professional uh, some personal data, it's a little bit complicated and it's, I don't think it's quite legal. Just a quick question for the Indian app, uh, since you had a, 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 a good uh, deep dive in it, how many users, how many people installed the app? Uh, uh, 100 millions at this time. 100 million? Yes, but this is, uh, uh, it was mandatory uh, yeah. for the last uh, weeks and uh, they decided to step back a little bit because it was not even legal uh, in India. And no, it's, uh, it's advice. Uh, it's strongly advised to install the application, but you yeah. still have some services uh, where you are forced to use uh, the application and to install the application. For example, if you want to go into a train, you need to have the application. Uh, yeah, I think there's is, is a bunch of countries where it's uh, mandatory, but was it mandatory if you are tested positive or mandatory period? Uh, period. Oh, okay. Uh, what about you guys? Have you, like, do you guys know how many countries have a tracing app for like uh, COVID-19 now? Or? Well, I, I looked a bit in this uh, issue with this topic, and um, there's a, I guess there's a decent number of these apps. So there's a list on uh, Wikipedia, right? There's a few other resources um, that I've seen, and uh, I think that maybe even Baptiste put together a list uh, himself that I have seen. Um, um, it's quite interesting. There's a large variety. Some are mandatory, some are optional. For some countries, there's even two different apps, uh, right, per region. Um, perhaps uh, maybe even Batiste wants to, to share his thoughts uh, about this. Yes, I, so I made a list on GitHub where you can, so there is a repo where you can you can find all the contact tracing application I found all over the world. And as Costin said, um, some, in some countries uh, you have two you have two application. For example, in Spain you have one application for Madrid and you have one for Catalonia. Uh, uh, in Italy, uh, it was the same thing. You you had multiple application at the beginning. Uh, in some countries, this is mandatory. I think it, uh, in Qatar recently, like two days ago, uh, they made the application mandatory in India, as we said, uh, but in a lot of Euro European countries, uh, this is optional. And in the US, uh, they released an application quite recently too. So we can see a lot of uh, initiative, a lot of new application made by the governments all over the world, uh, they all made different choices. In your, even in Europe, they didn't manage to uh, to do the same thing and to use the same protocols. There is a odd debate in uh, in France, especially uh, whether we have to use uh, a centralized protocol or a decentralized protocol. What is the best uh, in terms of privacy? So. This is, for, in my opinion, this is the biggest issue. Uh, we will see a lot of new application. Uh, all these application will be different. 
and uh, they will all the government will try to use the legal system, their legal system, in order to uh, to enforce the use of uh, this application. And some of these apps are not really privacy friendly, so we have to be to to be careful and to to expose what these contact tracing applications are really doing. And um, so based on uh, your observation, uh, since like the, the pandemic started, I guess it has been a few months now, uh, do you think like contact tracing uh, as an app is useful? Or what, do you, do, what type of like results do you think uh, governments are getting out of it? Because from one aspect, you know, like if you feel like they need to have an app to like keep track of uh, you know, data, you know, when we know they're just struggling to get their own numbers, like from hospitals and stuff, you know, and then suddenly like they expect an app is going to do it. Is it really useful for governments? Is it really useful for people? Clearly, um, this is um, this is not really useful at the moment. At the moment, we cannot prove uh, a mobile contact uh, tracing application is really useful uh, because this is something quite new. Uh, so we are uh, all the government are doing that for good reason. They are, they are trying to. Um, to do something, and they don't want uh, people to say, "Okay, you had the ability to create an application to to fight the pandemic, and you did nothing." So they want to do something to do something, and uh, as we can see, for example, in Iceland, um, say uh, forty percent of the population installed the application, and the, the top official uh, responsible of the contact tracers uh, teams said the application was not really useful. Um, for example, in France also, uh, we are quite sure that we will never have this level of adoption. Maybe the, the estimation we have, we will have maybe uh, five, between 5% or 10% or of the popul population uh, uh, with the application installed and we know that with this level uh, the application is not that useful uh, this is the same thing in Sa singapore singapore is an iceland uh, with a small population and even even with this configuration they didn't uh, manage to uh, to to use the application to fight the pandemic and they were forced to uh, to declare a lockdown so everybody, everyone is quite agree on the fact that today this is not magic. Uh, it's not really useful. It's creating new issues. For example, in Australia, uh, they uh, I think it was two days ago also, they said they were enabled to integrate the data the contact tra tracer were, were enabled to use the data from the application because there were uh, there is a integration issue so this new tool is not really helping the real professionals the contact tracers so in my opinion we need to put some effort on giving the tools to the contact tracer to the health professionals and uh, forget a little bit about this magical application so i guess question for all of you is there like a way to preserve uh uh, is privacy um, still possible with uh, contact tracing uh, protocols or do they have uh, some type of like identifiable uh, data that could be like released like uh, Gabriel was saying before with Xiaomi like this is unique code for instance that gets uh, released and it's quite easy to correlate uh, data with each other or like even metadata uh, which I guess for like most of the general public, you know, they would, uh, if you tell them, oh, it's anonymized uh, ID, they would be like, okay, whereas in fact, it can be like easily uh, identifiable and especially with tracing because it's all your location or, or where all the, all the people you have seen, where you have been. Um, so what do you think of like privacy in that scenario? And also from the apps you have seen that are claiming... Uh, that uh, privacy is uh, definitely uh, respected.
I think it pretty much depends on the effort that somebody wants to put into just unraveling whatever type of, uh, I don't know, uh, scheme the entity that stores the data used in order to anonymize all of that. Just like a lock pick, there's no such thing as a perfect lock. It, the effort is what matters. There, there is also an important point um, to, to say uh, in Europe, for example, uh, very, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of um, researchers uh, from universities all, all over Europe decided to work on the new contact tracing application protocol uh, with privacy, uh, privacy in mind. And even with their effort, uh, these guys are very, very good and they created a protocol, they did the, their best, but even with, uh, with this amount of skills, uh, time and effort, we can see that their protocol has some limitation. And as I said before, there is a odd debate between centralized or, or decentralized protocols. And we can see that in both uh, protocols, there is there, there is some limitation in terms of privacy and nothing is really perfect. And this is the core of the issue. Uh, we are fighting a pandemic and we, in order to try, in order to fight this pandemic, we are trying to put uh, technology as a solution and uh, preserve the privacy uh, it's a little bit complicated because at the end of the uh, of the journey, you want to uh, you want to go to the doctor. You need you need to go to the doctor. You need to be uh, cured by someone. So you need the identity of the infected people in order to say, okay, you have to stay home. So this is a human issue, and we need to uh, we need to to have to enforce the human relations, uh, in my opinion, uh, and uh, privacy cannot really be uh, protected uh, if we use the technology to fight the pandemic. And uh, what about Singapore, for instance, because uh, they tried different things, right? They have these uh, app like Trace Together, but they claim they would uh, open source it. I don't know if they ended up doing it. They uh, did. Yeah. They did. So has any other government used it and has the Singapore like experience been uh, successful because I've seen even in China like now they detected new cases uh, so they're doing the confinement and uh, 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 again and out of all the countries doing like uh, any like tracing or surveillance would expect China to be like uh, using like the uh, like later state of art you know like uh, in, in that term so like, is there any experience that had been successful so far or? Like Costin, maybe? Have you, uh, what have you seen? Then, uh, otherwise I feel like uh, uh, Baptiste is gonna answer to all the questions and uh, then you guys <laughs> well, gonna uh, become shy. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, I, it's, it's hard to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I was thinking about something I've seen in the chat. Uh, Veronique uh, was saying that uh, in the European Union we have strict data protection laws uh, that requires people to consent uh, before being tracked. And this actually reminds me of an interesting story from a few days ago. I got an, uh, a message from my uh, mobile company saying that uh, we just want to let you know that we will be sharing information, tracking information, which includes uh, uh, metadata produced by your smartphone, such as location, amount of traffic, uh, and so on, uh, with uh, different entities, including the European Commission. Uh, and it was just like a notification, just so you know. Uh, and at the very end, there was also a, a small note saying, well, by the way, if you don't like it, you can write us a message and uh, we will 
uh, remove your data from this uh, aggregated telemetry that we will be sending over. And uh, it, it turns out that actually uh, the European Commission has been reaching out to different big uh, GSM operators in all European Union countries, one operator per country, asking them for such information. So uh, many have been actually complaining exactly as Veronique is saying uh, um, that uh, there's no legal framework for the European Commission to ask for this information. And like, what is the basis of this request? Um, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. What I know is that for sure, uh, telcos are actually compiling, aggregating all this information. They, they are preparing to send it over. Uh, basically just uh, notification that the data will go. It's not like, can we send your data? No, it's your data will go and just FYI. And if you don't like that, uh, let us know. To be honest, I, I did write them an email and ask to be kept out of this metadata collection. And surprisingly, I got the reply. They even called and said that uh, they will not use my data hopefully. But I guess that all these uh, uh, frameworks and strict data protection rules, sometimes they can bend or twist, especially at the times of pandemics. And uh, what, what about uh, you, Gabriel? Have you seen uh, uh, vendors? Or do you think that would be uh, invisible, uh, like a possibility that vendors like Xiaomi would use the actual data that they already, already have to do like such uh, tracing instead of uh, asking people to install a new app? Uh, that I do not know. It's may I guess it's it mostly depends on where they store the data and what kind of uh, laws and uh, jurisdictions with the uh, the governments have over there. Mm. But if you think about it, they have data. I mean, in India at least, there they have twenty five percent of the market share. I haven't seen them exfiltrating any kind of uh, GPS uh, info. So this might be not that useful when it comes to doing any kind of contact tracing. The information that I they aggregate is more, let's say, commercial in nature. Yeah, it would be interesting to see actually for the data that uh, apps are collecting now if they can uh... Uh, actually reuse it and uh, reset it for later on uh, because do, do you guys have seen you know remember like when EFF did like uh, this grid of like oh like what uh, messenger application you should be using and what do, uh, what protection do you have when you don't have have you guys seen any like metrics of all those apps to see what kind of data is being collected by each of them as a matrix that would be quite a cool thing actually because you could see well what's the baseline or benchmark for data being collected and uh, if a country is collecting more data than another and if they could actually use that for like uh, for other things I don't think uh, I didn't see it on my side but we should do it definitely yeah cool uh, actually a question for you uh, Baptiste <laughs> from uh, <laughs> there's uh there's like few uh, few indian guys uh, in, in the chat now they're quite uh quite uh, a a excited to ask you a question so the first one which uh, you don't have to answer is what's your advice should indians uh, keep uh aragoya c2 or uninstall it and the second question is uh ask uh, elliot about the open source mode of uh, aragoya uh, that he was once asked to develop he um, install or not the application is quite a big question on the, I mean, you, you have to do this choice and this is your, this is a personal choice. So if you are okay to give a part of your privacy in exchange of some potential protection, uh, do it. I mean, you can install the application, but you have to know that this application is tracking the uh, the people you are meeting all the day and also uh, it's getting your GPS location. So if 
uh, at one point you are infected by the by COVID-19, the government will have all your data. So you know what is in the balance and you you have to decide decide yourself. And regarding the second question for uh, a mode of the application, this is quite, an, for me, it's uh, it was a big eti ethical question. Uh, we have, as an engineer, as an Android developer, we have uh, we have the ability to create to modify a contact tracing application in order to remove all the privacy and invas invasive features of the application. So, should we do it? It's not because we have the ability to do it. We we have the skills to do it. We have to do it. I decided on my side to not do it on on to not do a tutorial on how to do it uh, because I think uh, potentially uh, it will create it, um, too much alternative and it will spread the wrong message. I prefer to say to people, don't use it if you don't want to use it, use it if you want to use it, but uh, creating a, uh, a modified version is not, it's quite cool on, on the paper, but in reality, I don't think it will be uh, uh, a good thing. And uh, because uh, this is live and for people who are watching the replay, at least there's uh, an interesting proof of it. Do you guys remember when a bunch of government asked uh, Apple and Google to like uh, create some modification that they could use? Uh, even France actually was one of those governments because people are like, well, you guys are doing GDPR and then you find us and now you're asking us to modify our APIs uh, to uh, to like accommodate to your tracing uh, feature request. So I'm just going to show it on the screen now. Uh, but Sima just sent me like this, uh, this link, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. So someone just tweeted uh, 30 minutes ago. So at the time that uh, this is happening. A new update on uh, iOS uh, 13.5, uh, which apparently has uh, support for COVID-19 contact tracing apps uh, from public uh, health authorities. Uh, I well, I don't know if you guys have had time to see it, but uh, that's... Uh, yeah, that's seen that. You did? Alex, uh, Alex Tamos uh, tweeted about it, right? Uh, the tweet I have is from uh, Mike Murphy, actually. Um, yeah, any, any comments on that, uh, Kostin, since you saw the tweet? Well, it, it seemed uh, interesting, especially since we, we knew that this was coming for some time. And actually, um, today I was looking at the guidelines for the creation of these apps. So um, actually, um, I, I got to say that the guidelines um, actually looked uh, pretty good in the sense that... Um, um, there's only one application allowed per country, so they're not going to allow things like two applications per country. There should be just one that uses these uh, features. And uh, the most important one, in my opinion, was that um, all these uh, COVID-19 apps that use this uh, API, they're not allowed to use location uh, tracking. So they're not allowed to access your location. Very simple rule. So that means that these apps cannot track your movements around. That's uh, not uh, allowed by the policy. And of course, uh, this uses other things like Bluetooth, right? Uh, low power Bluetooth. Uh, and uh, that's absolutely, let's say, OK. Uh, but it seemed to me that was very nice uh, that it's forbidden to collect the location. And uh, what about you, Baptiste and uh, Gabriel? Uh, I, I don't know if you had time to, uh, to watch the specs, obviously, since it just got released. Uh, but any idea of what we can expect from that and uh, what that's for the iOS uh, release? So I guess the uh, Google one is going to be uh, released uh, soon. The, the Google one has been already released, as far as oh, I know. Did? Uh, yes, I think it's already open source on GitHub, so you you can find the, the sources. And um, 
what the protocol chose by Apple and Google is in reality um, derivated from the European uh, decentralized protocol created by some universities. And it's called, uh, it's coming from DP, uh, from a protocol called uh, DP3T. And this uh, protocol is quite good, in my opinion. This is the best protocol we have on the table at this moment. Uh, but as I said before, this is not perfect. There is some limitations. And um, if you go to the to the DP3T uh, GitHub uh, repo, you would see that there is some issues opened, uh, some some uh, some good issues, and uh, they did a great job trying to document uh, to to write down all the limitation and to explain what is wrong with their pro proposition. But at this moment, we don't really have a better uh, option. And this is why uh, Google and Apple try to, uh, to uh, this is why they took this proposition uh, package that with the Apple and protocol experience, let's, let's say it like this. And uh, they only, uh, what they did is quite clever because they only proposed to, uh, government an API so they cannot uh, they are not responsible of the applications uh, itself so I mean this is in my for me it's quite okay uh, this is a good proposition with some limitations it's not perfect but this is the best thing we have at the moment and uh, so there is multiple protocol. The one you just mentioned is, uh, what did you say, DT3T? No. Uh, DP3T, yes. yeah. And uh, how many protocols are like uh, currently uh, out there? D you, DP3T, yeah. You have like, uh, you have, I think, uh, you have two big, uh, two big protocols in, in Europe. You have the Robert protocol, uh, which is the French proposition. And also you have uh, this, As this one, the DP, <laughs> the <laughs> DP Friti, uh, uh, protocol. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, well, I guess we're reaching the end of uh, this panel. I don't see uh, any more questions uh, in the chat either. Uh, so... Yeah, like uh, uh, thanks uh, for joining us for this panel and to giving uh, uh, all the three of you uh, your your thoughts and uh, insight on the current uh, tracing and uh, like uh, tra tracking um, well uh, apps and uh, things that being out there. Obviously, like uh, COVID nineteen is one of the big one, but like we've seen in the keynote of Gabriel, that's not the only way uh, to be uh, tracked. Uh, well, uh, thanks to you guys, and uh, thanks. Yeah, hope to see you soon. And uh, thank you. So we're gonna be uh, getting ready for our last uh, speaker. I'm just checking if he's here. That's okay. Okay, he's here. Uh, I hope uh, you're, you're having a uh, what a great time and uh yeah i can see uh that uh people still have some questions on the uh avia uh law so if uh, that is if you're in the youtube chat i guess uh you, you can uh, answer there directly uh but uh yeah like uh veronique is saying in the chat you know like uh, your data is your data uh you should always uh keep an eye on it and obviously like uh, the one of the problem we have now is that uh unfortunately uh the data literacy if you can call it like this is uh is pretty weak uh with uh, a lot of people especially when you see like uh you know uh, apps being used by like millions of people uh overnight because they're being mandatory that does make uh, quite a significant uh, uh, change in the uh, in the landscape. Uh, well, enough uh, talking about uh, 
mobile tracking and tracing uh, tracing so the next presentation actually is uh, is pretty cool uh from team from uh, theory uh really awesome uh, awesome people over there uh so he wrote this blog post uh, i guess l last month now maybe like a few weeks ago about uh always escaping the chrome sandbox uh so that should be uh, pretty interesting i'm just gonna set uh, things up okay can you hear me great okay so uh thanks for inviting me to speak today matt um as you mentioned it's a little bit of a different topic than the other talks today, but uh, going to talk about how we um, exploited a bug in the Chrome sandbox uh, to, or in the browser process to escape the Chrome sandbox. So first, a little bit of background on me. Uh, my name is Tim Becker. Uh, my handle online is usually TJ Becker, sometimes with an underscore, as is the case on Twitter. And I'm a security researcher at Theory who's currently focused on browser exploitation, um, as you, I guess, could guess based on the title of the talk. Uh, but I'm also an avid CTF player. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with CTFs, they're capture the flag competitions. They're a sort form of hacking competition. It's actually how I got my start in security by playing these competitions in high school. And then I later joined PPP. Um, and I attribute most of what I know about security to playing CTFs. So if you haven't ever tried them, I recommend giving it a shot. Uh, but we're not here to talk about CTFs. We're here to talk about Chrome. So uh, on the agenda for today is first a bit of background about Chrome. So a little bit about the security architecture and uh, the IPC mechanisms in Chrome. And that should be enough to describe uh, the details of the bug and explain how it can be triggered. Um, and then we'll get into the details of how the bug was exploited. Um, and there's a little bit of a different approach that we use than um, typical sandbox escape bugs that have been uh, publicly disclosed. So you might find that interesting. Uh, and then at the end, there will be some higher level takeaways. So if you um, didn't especially care for the uh, nitty gritty details of the exploit, um, hopefully there's still something interesting at the end that you, uh, you might take away. So um, Chrome's philosophy for security is a slightly different than um, the other major browsers. Uh, Chrome doesn't implement a whole lot of exploit mitigation strategies and instead relies much more heavily on um, strong sandboxing. So most of the interesting attack surface on the web, such as uh, DOM rendering or script execution or anything media or graphics related, uh, typically runs in a sandbox process. Um, and in fact, Chrome actually is, I think, the only major browser implementing site isolation, which is a, a policy that keeps data from distinct origins in separate sandbox processes. Meaning that um, if a user visits a malicious website that compromises their browser or compromises um, one of these sandbox processes, uh, there's not very much that uh, a malicious attacker could do because data from other origins, such as Google or Facebook or Twitter, should be protected and not accessible from that um, sandbox process. Um, but obviously not all of Chrome can run unsandboxed, otherwise it couldn't really do anything uh, like web-related or access the, the file system or anything. So um, there is one central process called the browser process, which runs completely unsandboxed. And this is kind of the main process whenever Chrome is launched. And um, some of the other sandbox processes have um, varying degrees of sandboxing with access to different parts of the system, but uh, this, the browser process is usually the one being targeted um, in a sandbox escape exploit because it's completely unsandboxed. Um, and so this means that if an attacker wants to fully exploit Chrome, it typically requires two or more bugs. So first they have to get code execution within one of the sandbox processes. Um, and that usually requires one or more bugs. And then from there, they have to try to escape the sandbox. And again, this usually requires one or more bugs. And uh, the sandbox escape, especially lately, is usually the bottleneck here because um, you know, Chrome designs their security architecture so that 
um, you know, even if the sandbox processes get compromised, it's the attacker's ability should still be very limited. And they uh, have pretty strong security boundaries to prevent sandbox escapes. Uh, and so this talk is going to describe um, one bug in the browser process that a compromised uh, renderer process, which is kind of like the one of these processes that is responsible for rendering the DOM and script execution. Uh, can one of these uh, renderer processes can use this bug to get code execution in the browser process and therefore escape the sandbox. Okay, uh, a little bit about Chrome IPC. So all of these different sandbox processes are running and they need to communicate with one another. Um, so the primary IPC mechanism used in Chrome is called Mojo. Um, this is kind of a newer mechanism or um, IPC platform. And the legacy IPC platform is kind of entirely phased out, almost entirely phased out. Um, and so it's not going to be relevant for this talk, but I just wanted to mention it for good measure. Uh, Mojo is a platform agnostic implementation of like most of everything you would want to do IPC. And the way that it works is you specify your messages uh, that you want to be able to send across process boundaries in a Mojo IDL format. Um, and then during Chrome compilation, code for each of your target languages that you are going to use uh, in Chrome to communicate over this um, Mojo interface will, will be generated and um, you can link against it in all your various languages. So here's an example of that. Um, this is an example Mojo interface. It's actually the one that we're going to target, but um, I'll describe a little bit more about what its purpose is later. For now, just take away that um, you, you write this interface definition here. It defines one method called filter installed apps. And um, during compilation, some bindings get produced for all the various languages. Uh, for instance, C++, Java, if it's an Android Chrome build, and JavaScript. And these, these various bindings basically implement um, the interface in that corresponding language that if you were to implement this interface, uh, you should provide all of these methods and whatnot. Um, and then it also implements uh, proxy objects. So if, for instance, like if from C++ you want to uh, use an instance of an, an installed app provider um, in a remote process, you would use this proxy object to send and receive uh, messages. So um, if you notice, one of the target languages um, is JavaScript. And this means that uh, there's actually support for, Java, for uh, speaking over Mojo in JavaScript. And um, there's, an, there's a Blink flag, which Blink is kind of like the rendering engine in Chrome uh, for enabling Mojo.js, which allows uh, a web page script running in a web page context to directly talk over Mojo. And so, uh, of course, this feature is not enabled by default um, for security reasons. However, a compromised renderer um, can actually enable this feature without needing to escape the sandbox by just flipping the appropriate bit in memory and then starting a new JavaScript context. Um, what this means for the purposes of writing a sandbox escape exploit is that uh, you can essentially assume Mojo.js is enabled and it's kind of more or less equivalent to um, having a compromised renderer process if you just uh, enable this command line flag. It's not exactly the same because you don't have, you know, read write arbitrary read write access or anything uh, in the renderer with this, but um, most bugs that you're going to target for a sandbox escape just require speaking over Mojo. So, okay, so uh, a little bit more background on Chrome before I can describe the bug. Um, so every frame on a web page, which is you know the main frame or any iframes that are included, uh, are backed by a render frame host object in the browser process. Um, and this is kind of the main uh, point of communication for each frame uh, over IPC. And many of the Mojo interfaces that a renderer would want to acquire access to, to implement any of the web platform features, uh, it'll get a handle to it by asking the render frame host to um, create it for it. 
And so this code snippet here runs during initial initialization of a new render frame host. And it basically uh, populates a map for all the different interfaces uh, that it can provide. And then it gives a callback to invoke whenever a renderer um, requests that interface. And in this case, um, the callback simply just creates a new um, C++ implementation object implementing this interface and uh, hooks up the, the Mojo handle connection to that implementation. OK, so that should be enough to describe the bug. Uh, first, a little bit of background on the bug and its lifetime. So uh, for those that haven't heard, Edge browser is now Chromium based as of January this year. Um, and so the Edge developers are kind of working on a Chromium fork at the moment. Uh, and some of the features they're implementing are getting merged back into Chrome. Um, so this installed app provider interface that I showed you was originally only implemented on Android. And it, it was a feature, it was part of the web platform feature to uh, allow a website basically to um, check if, a, if the, like the corresponding native app is installed on the device. And um, I guess Microsoft wanted a, a similar feature, or I guess the same feature, to be implemented um, on Windows in Edge. So it could, a website could check if a native app is installed. Um, and so the Edge team implemented this interface uh, separately in C++. So the Android version was written in Java. Um, and so from a memory safety standpoint, it was probably secure. Um, but this version was written in C++, as is most of desktop Chrome. Um, and as I mentioned, some of these features are getting merged back into Chrome. And so this one actually did. And it landed in Chrome 81, which was uh, released sometime in March, I believe. Um, but it was behind an experimental flag because uh, this is a new experimental feature that they were trying out. And the implementation um, had a, a use after free vulnerability in it. But the interesting thing was that this bug was actually reachable uh, even with the flag disabled because uh, where they actually checked if this feature was enabled was just after uh, the bug was, could be triggered. And so uh, a little bit later, the code was refactored a little bit and the bug still existed, but it happened to be moved behind this experimental flag. But uh, I guess this is a, one an interesting takeaway is that um, because Chrome is, is on this like six week release cycle, uh, the reachable version of the bug was in Chrome 81, which you know, uh, should live for about six weeks before Chrome 82 comes out. And so this bug would have been exploitable in the wild for about um, six weeks. But we found it and reported it uh, just before Chrome 81 hit stable. So uh, thankfully it was fixed and it never got pushed out to users. Uh, so what actually is the bug? So this installed app provider impl is uh, the C++ implementation of this interface I described. And um, recall that it's created by the render frame host uh, whenever a, a certain frame in a, in a web page requests access to it. And so this object um, actually stores a pointer to this render frame host object. And this is a, a raw pointer. It's not a smart pointer of any kind that is able to detect uh, if this render frame object has been destroyed. And uh, in the implementation of this filter installed apps function that uh, this interface provides, it uses the pointer to uh, look up the, the corresponding render process and check if it's an incognito tab. Um, basically, it's a, a process level feature whether or not the, um, the web pages being rendered in it are um, incognito or not. And uh, the problem is that this render frame host can be freed from the renderer. Um, so for instance, if the render frame host corresponds to an iframe on the web page, if the web page removes that iframe, it causes the render frame host to be freed. And furthermore, uh, this installed app provider impl um, isn't freed whenever the render frame host is freed. Uh, it actually stays alive as long as the Mojo connection to it is kept open. This means that um, if a web page is able to free this render frame host before calling the filter installed apps, um, this render frame host pointer will be uh, stale and a use after free should occur. 
Okay, so now I'll describe how we can actually trigger this bug. Um, I alluded to it earlier, but here's the exact procedure. So uh, a web page can create a new render frame host um, by adding an iframe. And then in this iframe, in that corresponding JavaScript context, um, you can use Mojo.js, which uh, can be enabled by this compromise render process to request a handle to this installed app provider. And then we free the render frame host um, from the parent frame uh, by deleting this iframe. So the issue uh, that we face whenever we're trying to trigger this bug is that when you delete the iframe, uh, all of the JavaScript objects in that frame's context uh, get deleted. And that includes the uh, Mojo handle. And if you recall, we need to keep the, the Mojo connection open in order for uh, the, the use after free to be triggerable. So um, we found one way to keep this connection open, which is basically to, to take the Mojo handle from the child frame and pass it up to the parent frame. Uh, and there are a few ways to do this, but we used um, one of the Mojo.js features called Mojo Interface Interceptor. Uh, so then it, from the parent frame, we have this Mojo handle now pointing to this installed app provider uh, for a freed subframe. And now we can simply call the filter installed apps method and a use after free should occur. So here's actually what that looks like in JavaScript. So uh, in the parent frame, we run this first function, which triggers the bug. So as I alluded to on the previous slide, um, first we allocate a subframe. And then we set up this Mojo interface interceptor so that uh, we can basically receive the, the Mojo handle that we want from the child frame whenever it uh, has it prepared for us. And then um, whenever we get this handle from the child process, uh, we set up a proxy object to the installed app provider so that we can invoke the appropriate method. Um, and then we free the subframe and once it's freed, we can invoke the, the method and a use after free should occur. So then the code for the child frame is very simple. Uh, all it needs to do is create a Mojo message pipe to be able to send messages. And then it sends a message to the render frame host requesting access to the installed app provider. And it hooks that up to one end of the Mojo pipe. And with the other end, it sends it to the parent frame, um, which will later be used in the parent frame to set up the proxy object. Okay, so that's how the bug can be triggered. Um, now I'm gonna describe how we exploited it. So whenever you're exploiting a use after free like this, it's often useful to um, replace the freed object with controlled data. Um, and actually in the Chrome browser process, this is relatively easy because um, there's very little allocator hardening, which would prevent like objects of different types from uh, reclaiming the same memory. So it's also really easy to um, control allocations in the browser where you can make an allocation of any size and put any data there um, using the blobs API, which is just kind of a web platform feature that lets you store arbitrary uh, data blobs um, in like a browsing session. And furthermore, the render frame host is a huge object. It's one of the biggest it's like C++ objects in Chrome, which means that this uh, freed pointer is in a very rarely used heap bucket. So unless um, we're like creating another frame or something, it's very unlikely that this, uh, that this freed heap region is going to be reused, reused by anything else. So if we just um, allocate a very large blob of the same size as the render frame host, uh, it's extremely likely that it's going to replace that freed object. And now we have controlled data there. Um, and so as we um, discovered while exploiting this, it's usually just the first blob we allocate um, replaces the render frame host. But uh, for stability, we, we usually you know, do a few more just to be sure. OK, so um, this render frame host object has a bunch of pointers that it expects to have within it. And um, the problem is that with perfect ASLR, uh, there's no valid values that we could put for those pointers that would prevent a crash, let alone do anything useful. Um, but our sandbox escape was targeting Windows, recall, because this is a, a Windows feature. And Windows actually has a pretty 
significant ASLR weakness um, for uh, the sort of local privilege escalation scenario, which is that um, base addresses of images, meaning um, DLLs or executables, is only randomized once per boot. So uh, this means that like if the same DLL is loaded in multiple binaries on Windows or in, in multiple processes in Windows, uh, it should have the same base address. And conveniently, Chrome.dll is a massive 400 megabyte um, DLL, which is loaded in all of the Chrome processes. And so this means that if we're assuming we have a compromised renderer process, we should be able to acquire this Chrome.dll base address, and it should be the same in the browser process. So we actually do know a little bit of the memory layout of the browser process, at least where certain DLLs are loaded. And so if you recall the buggy line of code, uh, it's a virtual function call on this render frame host object. Um, so yeah, it takes the pointer and it calls get process. And um, if you know how virtual function calls work in C++, um, the object has a vtable pointer within it that points to a table of functions um, that, will, that can be invoked uh, if it's a virtual function call. And so if we have some code that we want to uh, jump to and like control flow hijack this get process call, uh, there needs to be a pointer to it at a known address so that we can point the vtable pointer um, to that code pointer. And um, unfortunately, we don't really know the address of any control data. So we can't kind of build arbitrary um, like code pointers at a known address. But the previous slide tells us that we, we do know where chrome.dll is loaded. And all of the uh, virtual function tables in Chrome are stored in this DLL. So this means that we're able to call any virtual function on any object defined in Chrome um, with our controlled render frame host object. Um, so unfortunately, this doesn't seem like it's enough to uh, get arbitrary code execution yet because um, it's very unlikely that there's just a virtual function in Chrome that we can just sort of redirect this call to uh, that will give us code execution. So we'll have to build some stronger primitives out of this. And typically to do that, we'll want to exploit the bug multiple times uh, or trigger the bug multiple times in different ways to sort of manipulate the Chrome process into doing something more useful. Um, but there's a slight problem with that in this case, which is that um, the result of this virtual function call to get process is used to make another virtual call uh, called get browser context. And then that result is used to make yet another virtual function call. And so if we just point get process at some virtual function, uh, we'd have to make sure that it's returning sort of a process object or some object that you know, meets the constraints that will prevent those future calls from crashing. And um, that is extremely limiting. But fortunately, we found a nice way around this, which was to uh, instead point get process to some virtual function that just returns like the address of a class member or a reference to a class member, which in machine code just takes the, the this pointer and adds a small offset to it um, so that it's returning a pointer into data that we still control because we have this massive blob that has replaced the render frame host. And so get process will or whatever we redirect get process to will return a pointer that still points into our controlled data. And then get browser process is another, or sorry, get browser context is another virtual call. And so we're in the same scenario as we were with get process. And so we can once again do uh, redirect it to this virtual function that returns a small offset ahead. And finally, we have the third virtual call, which we fully control. And now it can return any value. So we truly can redirect this to any virtual call. And um, the process shouldn't crash. And whatever the result of this uh, final virtual call is um, shouldn't affect the stability of the, the Chrome process. So here's a diagram that summarizes everything I've said so far about the exploit. So we have our blob that has replaced the freed render frame host object. 
And within it, we're putting these vtable pointers um, into the chrome.dll, which is uh, we're able to know the base address of it based on leaking it from the renderer process. So in chrome.dll is all of the code implementing Chrome, as well as uh, the data, and that includes the virtual function tables. So we take our first vtable pointer and we point it at this virtual function. There's many of them, but we choose one that uh, returns a pointer, which is eight bytes ahead of the first one, which is exactly one word, one pointer. Um, and so we can repeat the same thing for the second virtual call. And then the third call, we can point at some different vtable, which invokes some different target function. And that target function will run whenever we uh, trigger the use after free. So um, now we can start to build more powerful primitives. And uh, we'd like to be able to jump to arbitrary code. Um, that's a, usually a useful exploitation primitive. So to do that, we want to be able to build a, a fake code pointer and put it at a known address. And um, the problem is that most of the data that we can control in the Chrome browser process is in the heap. So to do that, uh, we need to get a heap pointer. And so it's actually really easy to do given what we have so far, we can just use a target function, which is a virtual function that does some new allocation and stores it into a class member. Because what this will actually do is place that pointer into our blob, because our blob has replaced the freed render frame host object. And then because it's a blob, we can ask the browser process at any point in time to send the data back to us, because it's blobs is just kind of like a generic data store. And uh, so we can read the blob data back and within it should be the heap pointer of that new allocation. So then from here, there's one sort of common path used to um, escape the sandbox. So now that we have a heap pointer, we can put a, we can spray code pointers into the heap and then point the V table at it and um, have like arbitrary control flow hijack. Um, so one thing that's commonly done is to jump to a stack pivot gadget, which puts the, the stack pointer into um, one of our controlled blobs in the heap. And then you can use return oriented programming to um, execute arbitrary code. Um, but we actually used a slightly different approach that for this bug at least uh, was a lot cleaner and easier to achieve. So. What we decided to do instead was disable the sandbox. So remember that we're already assuming that uh, this bug is being used in a chain um, where we can compromise a renderer process at will. And so if we create a renderer process which is running unsandboxed, then the other part of this bug change is going to execute code outside the sandbox if we can, um, if we can get that to occur. So, uh, in order to get Chrome to run unsandboxed, you can pass this command line flag, dash dash no sandbox. And um, this flag is propagated from the, the main browser process to all the child processes, uh, which implement most of the sandboxing. And so if this flag is passed to a child process, it basically skips um, setting up the, the sandbox. And so if we were able to just kind of append the sandbox flag to the browser process at runtime, uh, it should get propagated to the child process. And then these new renderer processes, which we're able to exploit, uh, will be running outside the sandbox. So thankfully, this is actually really easy to do. There's a, a function in Chrome called set command line flags for sandbox type, which takes a command line flag object, which is just kind of a parsed version of the command line string past the Chrome. And it takes a sandbox type, which is just a C++ enum so you know, just small integer values. And if we can call this function with the browser process's command line object and pass the appropriate integer for no sandbox, then it will append this switch to the object. Uh, and so then any process that's created will run on sandbox after this point. And uh, one other benefit of this approach, I mean, beyond just the fact that it's, it's a little easier than ROP, is that uh, it's a slightly more platform independent because you know, ROP payloads usually are um, have to be tuned 
like to a significant degree to the platform you're trying to exploit. But this approach works kind of the same on all platforms, provided you can get the, the offsets out of the Chrome binary easily. So we think it has some benefits. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, that function that we want to call, uh, we have to control the arguments for it. And also, it's a non-virtual function. So we can't just use our, um, our virtual function sort of gadgets to uh, invoke it. So we want to call this function with controlled arguments. And there's actually a convenient object in Chrome, which already does this. It's a, a Chrome callback object. It essentially just stores a function pointer with some, <clears throat> some bound arguments. So there are many, many virtual functions in Chrome, which uh, invoke these callbacks, which are stored. And there's many virtual functions that sort of have uh, this callback object waiting to be called um, whenever this whenever the virtual function runs. And the the approach that we took here is to um, invoke one of these virtual functions and control the function pointer and the arguments for the callback and uh, basically point it at that command line flag function with the appropriate object and, uh, and enum. And uh, that's basically it for the exploit. Um, so some takeaways are that uh, because Edge is now Chromium based, the Edge developers are working with basically a relatively new code base to them. And so some common pitfalls that might occur in, uh, in Chrome programming might be re-emerging just simply because it's a, it's a newer code base to the developers. Um, and interestingly, some of these bugs will not just affect Edge, but will actually get merged back into Chrome. Uh, another big takeaway is that um, exploiting browser process bugs to escape the sandbox um, can probably be done entirely in JavaScript now. So you likely don't need to write your sandbox escape component in native code uh, and run it in a compromised renderer process. Um, also, an ASLR weakness in Windows is one of the key things that made the single bug exploitable. You know, otherwise we probably would have needed a second bug, which would give us some sort of information leak from the um, browser process. And in fact, Mac OS and iOS both have a similar ASLR weakness. Um, so this bug would have likely been exploitable on Mac OS as well. Uh, however, it seems to me then that Linux and Android have the strongest ASLR when it comes to this local privilege escalation scenario. And so exploiting Chrome boxes or uh, sandbox escapes on Chrome on Android is probably currently the hardest target when it comes to ASLR at least. And uh, for us, disabling the sandbox was a much cleaner and more adaptable approach than um, getting arbitrary code execution in the browser process. So with that, I think I have time for some questions. And um, if you want to see all the details, uh, there's a nice blog post on our website at theory.io. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, definitely the the blog post uh, is uh, nice. is an uh, understatement. Like it was very well written with the nice graphs and uh, it was uh, like the other like good blog posts I see that, that are like that, that good and uh, in terms of like well written and everything is like Project Zero. They also have like some pretty good uh, uh, blog posts. So, yeah, but the slides were pretty uh, awesome too. Uh, reminder, well, by you. the way, don't don't uh, forget to send me uh, your slides, or you can make a pull request uh, directly. Um, okay. That's uh, that, that's pretty cool. So, so what did you say? Like Linux and Android, the the strongest. Uh, because you said like Windows had some uh, ASLR like uh, weaknesses and same thing on uh, Mac OS, but not on Linux Android. Uh, yeah, that's right. As far as I'm aware, uh, there, there's no equivalent weakness on Linux and therefore not on Android either. And so um, for this local privilege escalation scenario where you already have code running in one process and you want to um, exploit another process on the same machine, uh, Linux and Android seem to be, seem to have the strongest ASLR in that scenario. And, uh, question from, uh, Jaziel, 
Uh, I might have missed it, but how long did it take to find the bug? Uh, how long did it take to exploit? Yeah, um, so finding the bug, um, it wasn't. It didn't take too long, actually, because this is a, a variant of previous bugs that had been uh, reported. And so um, using the Chrome code search tool, I was just able to uh, basically look for similar code patterns. And uh, this was one of the results. So I don't know, maybe probably a few days of understanding um, that bug report and then looking for variants of it was enough to find it. Um, and then writing the exploit uh, took probably about a week or two. Um, I think I took some breaks in between whenever I would hit a, a wall, like the ASLR situation or um, trying to avoid a crash and whatnot. So on and off, I'd say about a week or two. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty good actually. And uh, I don't, you didn't mention it, so I don't know if you used it uh, in that scenario, but uh, I would be also interested to hear your thoughts. What do you think about uh, CodeQL? Did you try to make a, a script on a, a, like a query on a CodeQL to uh, find that bug? Did you play with it a bit or like, uh, could that uh, be helpful? I'm just asking because I started to look at it like yesterday. I was like, oh, that's quite cool actually, because you can do like data tenting all those things. I was like, oh, I've been living yeah. under a rock. Where, where was I when the, this thing was released? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I actually didn't use it to find this bug, but I have since been learning it and am trying to apply that uh, using CodeQL to find other bugs um, with slightly different code patterns. So yeah, it's it's a great thought and I think it's a promising um, technology. Yeah, because I would assume uh, here uh, the, the Chrome sandbox is open source, right? Because I think with CodeQL, we need to uh, recompile something to create like a CodeQL database and all those things. Yep, that's right. Um, there's actually a, a great blog post. Um, I forget the author's name, but uh, he found a few sandbox escapes um, using CodeQL, and he actually open sourced uh, the queries he used as well as uh, gave a brief description of how he he built the CodeQL database for Chrome. Uh, it's on GitHub somewhere, so if I can find the link, I'll I'll include it somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And also, like uh, for the GitHub, when you make your pull pull request, there is a, a readme.md. So feel free to add in your reference link uh, uh, to it. Sure. <laughs> Chazil is like, oh, switch at my next uh, question. Uh, but yeah, like uh, I do agree. It's quite uh, it, it's it's quite amazing because. Well, although you said like that bug, like it took you only, uh, although like I don't think uh, uh, you're like uh, a good benchmark for that, but you say it took you like a few days huh, to, to find it, right? Uh, for that particular variant, yeah. I mean, so yeah. I have been looking for bugs in Chrome for quite a while before that, but, okay, okay, that um, makes sense. you know, learning the code base and getting familiar with it. But that particular bug variant I was I was looking for, yeah, that, that only took a, a few days because it was just a few hundred results in the Chrome code search tool. And uh, how many engines are using uh, Chromium now? So you select two of uses is Chrome and uh, Edge. So, but is they're not using it yet? They're planning to? Uh, no, actually, um, they are, right? the latest releases of Edge are Chromium based. And okay. um, as far as I'm aware, this bug was in Edge as well. Okay, got it. Yeah. And uh, 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 yeah, I guess like uh, for Edge, it's a bit more tricky with like uh, uh, applica like Windows Defender, Application Guard, and all those things. Like the sandbox is probably, uh, I mean, uh, I, I guess like you would have to like, uh, well, I guess not everyone is using uh, Windows Application Defender Guard, but uh, mm -hmm. Application Guard. Um, did you did you look at uh, the Edge variant yet, just uh, for fun, or to see, to compare like the exploitation or? Uh, no, actually, I, I haven't tried exploiting it in Edge. Um, I, I haven't looked into Edge too much yet okay. um, as an independent project. I know that um, the the parts of Edge that are built on top of Chromium aren't exactly open source. Uh, the latest I've checked, they're mm. uh, last I checked, like the open source release for it actually just had compiled object files for all the the things that Edge adds to base Chromium. Um, so it's a, it's a little more tedious to uh, research, but I'm planning to look at it in the future. Yeah, like uh, th that would be also like uh, quite interesting because 
I mean, for application guard, I think now it's an option only in enterprise version of Windows, so it's not very like mainstream. So I don't think you would need to like uh, bypass it. But mm -hmm. I think they're expanding the usage to like Microsoft Office now, and I would not be surprised if, you know, like by next year or in two years, it would be like a by default uh, feature. To be honest, at that point, uh, yeah, which would be like. Uh, quite cool but then you need like some uh, <laughs> some like hyper v like box you know to escape uh, <laughs> that would be like pretty crazy um yeah. uh, cool uh do we have any more questions from the chat i uh well don't think so uh well uh thanks for uh for your time team and for like uh joining us uh to tonight i guess this morning yeah you're, you're in texas right uh no, I'm actually in Wisconsin, but same time. Okay, zone. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, it was very interesting. Uh, I'm definitely going to rewatch it. Uh, that, uh, that's, that was pretty cool. Uh, thanks yeah, again, thank Tim. Thanks for inviting me. Hi, guys. So that's it. We're approaching well we're not even approaching this is uh this is the end you know like uh jaziel you missed uh all the opportunities uh to ask uh, more like uh interesting questions um but although like we can uh, still continue uh, to discuss uh, it on the discord after uh, and if you guys haven't joined uh definitely join the discord so you can uh, watch uh, Jaziel's uh, progress with uh, CodeQL and uh, <laughs> get the, the daily report. And uh, I, I said it, but you know, like, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, it's easier to get notifications, so I don't need to send like uh, to send emails. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any feedback for today's edition, do not hesitate. Like you can send me a DM on Twitter or just like a message on discord and uh yeah fa thanks for for watching i hope you enjoyed it so the presentation uh, slides should be up uh, either like tonight uh right after uh, this or tomorrow so they're gonna be uh, on github the link is in the description of uh this uh, stream so if you just check the uh, uh youtube description you're gonna see like the uh, uh description uh, if you want to watch the previous edition of, uh, well, Upcode uh, live stream, uh, they are on YouTube also, so that's uh, that's quite uh, also convenient. And usually we uh, also tweak, you know, when we have some uh, live issues where like there's too much noise in the background or if there is like some uh, any technical issues, like we fix it uh, uh, after and we upload like a cleaner version uh, on YouTube. Uh, but today, like, uh, I don't know, uh, luckily we didn't have any issues and as usual, you know, like, uh, because it's live and, uh, like, uh, you know, Dragos was asking me, like, uh, if I was like, uh, alone, yes, uh, I'm doing that, uh, alone here. Uh, so whenever there is no issue, I'm, uh, quite, uh, content with that. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and every time it's uh, still a bit, uh, uh, stressful. Uh, but yeah, feedback, feedback is welcome if you have any recommendation suggestion if there is any glue, good blog post that you have seen um, because the format and I think it's gonna stay like this for a while because that's already the fifth edition you know one edition every two weeks uh, same thing you know like three four like uh, talks you know uh, or an average of uh, 30 minutes uh, for each of them and uh yeah that's pretty much it so if you see even any good blog post or even if you do have because i know a lot of uh the the people watching are, are usually uh quite uh quite technical too if you have a good blog post that you want to talk about uh definitely uh let me know uh it does not need to be exclusive as long as it's uh, very interesting and uh there's so many like content uh online to read now uh, that it's pretty hard to track so my uh, my reading schedule now is basically to invite people to discuss about uh, whatever stuff they they wrote about, so I can learn at the same time, rather than just trying to uh, go like straight into reading it and getting all the the details, you know. Uh, 
so far that's pretty much uh, how I'm managing my uh, reading list and uh, as an audience I also encourage you to do uh, the same thing so if there's uh, cool stuff that you have seen uh, don't hesitate to uh, share the link and uh, if there's like themes uh, you want to talk about uh, definitely uh, so we have a few presentations uh, for the next edition but the CFP is always open if you just go on the website anyone can uh, submit and uh, yeah so Thanks again, everyone, and have a nice evening or a nice day uh, wherever you're from. Thank you.